Chapter 32 of The Gilded Age. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Gillian Weiss. The Gilded Age by Mark Twain and Charles Dudley Warner. Chapter 32. Washington's delight in his beautiful sister was measureless. He said that she had always been the queenliest creature in the land, but that she was only commonplace before compared to what she was now, so extraordinary was the improvement wrought by rich, fashionable attire. "'But your criticisms are too full of brotherly partiality to be depended on, Washington. Other people will judge differently.' "'Indeed they won't. You'll see.' There will never be a woman in Washington that can compare with you. You'll be famous within a fortnight, Laura. Everybody will want to know you. You wait. You'll see. Laura wished in her heart that the prophecy might come true. And privately, she even believed it might. For she had brought all the women whom she had seen since she left home under sharp inspection, and the result had not been unsatisfactory to her. During a week or two, Washington drove about the city every day with her, and familiarized her with all of its salient features. She was beginning to feel very much at home with the town itself, and she was also fast acquiring ease with the distinguished people she met at the Dilworthy table, and losing what little of country timidity she had brought with her from Hawkeye. She noticed with secret pleasure the little start of admiration that always manifested itself in the faces of the guests when she entered the drawing-room arrayed in evening costume. She took comforting note of the fact that these guests directed a very liberal share of their conversation toward her. She observed with surprise that famous statesmen and soldiers did not talk like gods, as a general thing, but said rather commonplace things for the most part, and she was filled with gratification to discover that she, on the contrary, was making a good many shrewd speeches and now and then a really brilliant one, and furthermore, that they were beginning to be repeated in social circles about the town. Congress began its sittings, and every day or two Washington escorted her to the gallery set apart for lady members of the households of senators and representatives. Here was a larger field and a wider competition, but still she saw that many eyes were uplifted toward her face, and that first one person, and then another, called a neighbor's attention to her, she was not too dull to perceive that the speeches of some of the younger statesmen were delivered about as much and perhaps more at her than to the presiding officer, and she was not sorry to see that the dapper young senator from Iowa came at once and stood in the open space before the president's desk to exhibit his feet as soon as she entered the gallery, where she had early learned from common report that his usual custom was to prop them on his desk and enjoy them himself with a selfish disregard of other people's longings. Invitations began to flow in upon her, and soon she was fairly in society. The season was now in full bloom, and the first select reception was at hand, that is to say, a reception confined to invited guests. Senator Dilworthy had become well convinced, by this time, that his judgment of the country-bred Missouri girl had not deceived him. It was plain that she was going to be a peerless missionary in the field of labor he had designed for her, and therefore it would be perfectly safe and likewise judicious to send her forth well panoplied for her work, so he had added new and still richer costumes to her wardrobe, and assisted their attractions with costly jewelry loans on the future land sale. This first select reception took place at a cabinet minister's, or rather a cabinet secretary's mansion. When Laura and the senator arrived, about half-past nine or ten in the evening, the place was already pretty well crowded, and the white-gloved negro servant at the door was still receiving streams of guests. The drawing-rooms were brilliant with gaslight, and as hot as ovens. The host and hostess stood just within the door of entrance. Laura was presented, and then she passed on into the maelstrom of bejeweled and richly attired, low-necked ladies, and white kid-gloved and steel pen-coated gentlemen, and wherever she moved, 
she was followed by a buzz of admiration that was grateful to all her senses, so grateful indeed that her white face was tinged and its beauty heightened by a perceptible suffusion of color. She caught such remarks as, Who is she? Superb woman! That's the new beauty from the West, etc., etc. Whenever she halted, she was presently surrounded by ministers, generals, congressmen, and all manner of aristocratic people. Introductions followed, and then the usual original question, How do you like Washington, Miss Hawkins? Supplemented by that other usual original question, Is this your first visit? These two exciting topics being exhausted, conversation generally drifted into calmer channels, only to be interrupted at frequent intervals by new introductions and new inquiries as to how Laura liked the capital and whether it was her first visit or not. And thus for an hour or more the Duchess moved through the crush in a rapture of happiness, for her doubts were dead and gone. Now she knew she could conquer here. A familiar face appeared in the midst of the multitude, and Harry Brierly fought his difficult way to her side, his eyes shouting their gratification, so to speak. Oh, this is a happiness. Tell me, my dear Miss Hawkins. Shh, I know what you're going to ask. I do like Washington. I like it ever so much. No, but I was going to ask. Yes, I'm coming to it. Coming to it as fast as I can. It is my first visit. I think you should know that yourself. And straight away, the wave of the crowd swept her beyond his reach. Now, what can that girl mean? Of course she likes Washington. I'm not such a dummy as to have to ask her that. And as to its being her first visit, why, bang it, she knows that I knew it was. Does she think I've turned idiot? Curious girl, anyway. But how do they swarm about her? She is the reigning belle of Washington after this night. She'll know five hundred of the heaviest guns in the town before this night's nonsense is over. And this isn't even the beginning. Just as I used to say, she'll be a card in the matter of, yes, sir, she shall turn the men's heads, and I'll turn the women's. What a team that will be in politics here. I wouldn't take a quarter of a million for what I can do in this present session. No, indeed, I wouldn't. Now, here, I don't altogether like this. That insignificant secretary of legation is... Why, she's smiling on him as if he... And now on the admiral. Now she's illuminating that stuffy congressman from Massachusetts, vulgar, ungrammatical, shovel-maker, greasy knave of spades. I don't like this sort of thing. She doesn't appear to be much distressed about me. She hasn't looked this way once. All right, my bird of paradise, if it suits you, go on. But I think I know your sex. I'll go to smiling around a little, too, and see what effect that will have on you. And he did smile around a little, and got as near to her as he could to watch the effect. But the scheme was a failure. He could not get her attention. She seemed wholly unconscious of him, and so he could not flirt with any spirit. He could only talk disjointedly. He could not keep his eyes on the charmers he talked to. He grew irritable, jealous, and very unhappy. He gave up his enterprise, leaned his shoulder against a fluted pilaster, and pouted while he kept watch upon Laura's every movement. His other shoulder stole the bloom from many a lovely cheek that brushed him in the surging crush, but he noted it not. He was too busy, cursing himself inwardly for being an egotistical imbecile, an hour ago he had thought to take this country lass under his protection, and show her life, and enjoy her wonder and delight. And here she was, immersed in the marvel up to her eyes, and just a trifle more at home in it than he was himself. And now his angry comments ran on again. Now she's sweetening old brother Balaam, and he, well, he's inviting her to the congressional prayer meeting. No doubt, better let old Dilworthy alone to see that she don't overlook that. And now it's Splurge of New York and now it's Batters of New Hampshire, and now the Vice President. Well, I may as well adjourn. I've got enough. But he hadn't. He got as far as the door, and then struggled back to take one more look, hating himself all the while for his weakness. Toward midnight, when supper was announced, the crowd thronged to the supper room where a long table was decked out with what seemed a rare repast, but which consisted of things better calculated to feast the eye than the appetite. The ladies were soon seated in files along the wall, and in groups here and there, and the colored waiters filled the plates and glasses, and the male guests moved hither and thither, conveying them 
to the privileged sex. Harry took an ice and stood up by the table with other gentlemen, and listened to the buzz of conversation while he ate. From these remarks he learned a good deal about Laura that was news to him. For instance, that she was of a distinguished Western family, that she was highly educated, that she was very rich and a great landed heiress, that she was not a professor of religion, and yet was a Christian in the truest and best sense of the word, for her whole heart was devoted to the accomplishment of a great and noble enterprise. None other than the sacrificing of her landed estates to the uplifting of the downtrodden Negro and the turning of his erring feet into the way of light and righteousness. Harry observed that as soon as one listener had absorbed the story, he turned about and delivered it to his next neighbor, and the latter individual straightway passed it on, and thus he saw it travel the round of the gentlemen and overflow rearward among the ladies. He could not trace it backward to its fountainhead, and so he could not tell who it was that started it. One thing annoyed Harry a great deal, and that was the reflection that he might have been in Washington days and days ago, and thrown his fascinations about Laura with permanent effect, while she was new and strange to the capital, instead of dawdling in Philadelphia to no purpose. He feared he had missed a trick, as he expressed it. He only found one little opportunity of speaking again with Laura before the evening's festivities ended, and then, for the first time in years, his airy self-complacency failed him. His tongue's easy confidence forsook it in great measure, and he was conscious of an unheroic timidity. He was glad to get away and find a place where he could despise himself in private and try to grow his clipped plumes again. When Laura reached home, she was tired but exultant, and Senator Dilworthy was pleased and satisfied. He called Laura my daughter next morning, and gave her some pin money, as he termed it, and she sent a hundred and fifty dollars of it to her mother, and loaned a trifle to Colonel Sellers. Then the senator had a long private conference with Laura, and unfolded certain plans of his for the good of the country, and religion, and the poor, and temperance, and showed her how she could assist him in developing these worthy and noble enterprises. End of chapter 32《Chapter Thirty Three of the Gilded Age》This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Richard Kilmer.《The Gilded Age by Mark Twain and Charles Dudley Warner.》Chapter Thirty Three Laura soon discovered that there were three distinct aristocracies in Washington. One of these nicknamed the Antiques, consisted of cultivated, high-bred old families who looked back with pride upon an ancestry that had been always great in the nation's councils and its wars from the birth of the Republic downward. Into this select circle it was difficult to gain admission. Number two was the aristocracy of the middle ground, of which more anon. Number three lay beyond, of it we will say a word here. We will call it the aristocracy of the parvenus, as, indeed, the general public did. Official position, no matter how obtained, entitled a man to a place in it, and carried his family with him, no matter whence they sprang. Great wealth gave a man a still higher and nobler place in it than did official position. If this wealth had been acquired by conspicuous ingenuity, with just a pleasant little spice of illegality about it, all the better. This aristocracy was fast, and not adverse to ostentation. The aristocracy of the antiques ignored the aristocracy of the parvenus. The parvenus laughed at the antiques, and secretly envied them. There were certain important society customs which one in Laura's position needed to understand. For instance, when a lady of any prominence comes to one of our cities and takes up her residence, all the ladies of her grade favor her in turn with an initial call, giving their cards to the servant at the door by way of introduction. 
They come singly, sometimes, sometimes in couples, and always in elaborate full dress. They talk two minutes and a quarter, and then go. If the lady receiving the call desires a further acquaintance, she must return the visit within two weeks. To neglect it beyond that time means let the matter drop. But if she does return the visit within two weeks, it then becomes the other party's privilege to continue the acquaintance or drop it. She signifies her willingness to continue it by calling again any time within twelve months. After that, if the parties go on calling upon each other once a year, in our large cities, that is sufficient, and the acquaintanceship holds good. The thing goes along smoothly now. The annual visits are made and returned with peaceful regularity and bland satisfaction. Although it is not necessary that the two ladies shall actually see each other oftener than once every few years, their cards preserve the intimacy and keep the acquaintance intact. For instance, Mrs. A. pays her annual visit, sits in her carriage, and sends in her card with the lower right-hand corner turned down, which signifies that she has called in person. Mrs. B. sends down word that she is engaged or wishes to be excused, or, if she is a parvenu and low-bred, she perhaps sends word that she is not at home. Very good. Mrs. A. drives on, happy and content. If Mrs. A.'s daughter marries, or a child is born to the family, Mrs. B. calls, sends in her card with the upper left-hand corner turned down, and then goes along about her affairs, for that inverted corner means congratulations. If Mrs. B.'s husband falls downstairs and breaks his neck, Mrs. A. calls, leaves her card with the upper right-hand corner turned down, and then takes her departure. This corner means condolence. It is very necessary to get the corners right, else one may unintentionally condole with a friend on a wedding or congratulate her upon a funeral. If either lady is about to leave the city, she goes to the other's house and leaves her card with P.P.C. engraved under the name, which signifies Pay Parting Call. But enough of etiquette. Laura was early instructed in the mysteries of society life by a competent mentor, and thus was preserved from troublesome mistakes. The first fashionable call she received from a member of the ancient nobility, otherwise the antiques, was of a pattern with all she received from that limb of the aristocracy afterwards. This call was paid by Mrs. Major General Folk Folkerson and daughter. They drove up at one in the afternoon in a rather antiquated vehicle with a faded coat of arms on the panels, an aged white-wooled negro coachman on the box, and a younger darky beside him, the footman. Both of these servants were dressed in dull brown livery that had seen considerable service. The ladies entered the drawing-room in full character, that is to say, with Elizabethan stateliness on the part of the dowager, and an easy grace and dignity on the part of the young lady, that had a nameless something about it that suggested conscious superiority. The dresses of both ladies were exceedingly rich as to material, but as notably modest as to color and ornament. All parties having seated themselves, the dowager delivered herself of a remark that was not unusual in its form, and yet it came from her lips with the impressiveness of scripture. The weather has been unpropitious of late, Miss Hawkins. It has indeed, said Laura. The climate seems to be variable. It is its nature of old here, said the daughter, stating it apparently as a fact, only, and by her manner, waving aside all personal responsibility on account of it. Is it not so, Mamma? Quite so, my child. Do you like winter, Miss Hawkins? She said like, as if she had an idea that its dictionary meaning was approve of. Not as well as summer, though I think all seasons have their charms. It is a very just remark. The general held similar views. He considered snow in winter proper, sultriness in summer legitimate, frosts in the autumn the same, and rain in spring not objectionable. He was not an exacting man, 
and I call to mind now that he always admired thunder. You remember, child, your father always admired thunder. He adored it. No doubt it reminded him of battle, said Laura. Yes, I think perhaps it did. He had a great respect for nature. He often said there was something striking about the ocean. You remember him saying that, daughter? Yes, often, mother. I remember it very well. And hurricanes. He took a great interest in hurricanes. And animals. Dogs, especially hunting dogs. Also comets. I think we all have our predilections. I think it is this that gives variety to our tastes. Laura coincided with this view. Do you find it hard and lonely to be so far from your home and friends, Miss Hawkins? I do find it depressing sometimes, but then there is so much about me here that is novel and interesting that my days are made up more of sunshine than shadow. Washington is not a dull city in the season, said the young lady. We have some very good society indeed, and one need not be at a loss for means to pass the time pleasantly. Are you fond of watering places, Miss Hawkins? I have really had no experience of them, but I have always felt a strong desire to see something of fashionable watering place life. We in Washington are unfortunately situated in that respect, said the Dowager. It is a tedious distance to Newport, but there is no help for it. Laura said to herself, Long Branch and Cape May are nearer than Newport. Doubtless these places are low. I'll feel my way a little and see. Then she said aloud, Why, I thought that Long Branch... There was no need to feel any further. There was that in both faces before her which made that truth apparent. The Dowager said, Nobody goes there, Miss Hawkins, at least only persons of no position in society. And the President, she added with tranquility. Newport is damp and cold and windy and excessively disagreeable, said the daughter, but it is very select. One cannot be fastidious about minor matters when one has no choice. The visit had spun out nearly three minutes now. Both ladies rose with grave dignity and conferred upon Laura a formal invitation to call, and then retired from the conference. Laura remained in the drawing-room and left them to pilot themselves out of the house, an inhospitable thing, it seemed to her, but then she was following her instructions. She stood, steeped in reverie a while, and then she said, I think I could always enjoy icebergs, as scenery, but not as company. Still, she knew these two people by reputation, and was aware that they were not icebergs when they were in their own waters and amid their legitimate surroundings, but on the contrary were people to be respected for their stainless characters and esteemed for their social virtues and their benevolent impulses. She thought it a pity that they had to be such changed and dreary creatures on occasion of state. The first call Laura received from the other extremity of the Washington aristocracy followed close upon the heels of the one we have just been describing. The callers this time were the Honorable Mrs. Oliver Higgins, the Honorable Mrs. Patrick O'Reilly, Miss Brzee O'Reilly, Mrs. Peter Gashley, Miss Gashley, and Miss Emmeline Gashley. The three carriages arrived at the same moment from different directions. They were new and wonderfully shiny, and the brasses on the harnesses were highly polished and bore complicated monograms. There were showy coats of arms, too, with Latin mottoes. The coachman and footmen were clad in bright new livery of striking colors, and they had black rosettes with shaving brushes projecting above them on the sides of their stovepipe hats. When the visitors swept into the drawing-room, they filled the place with a suffocating sweetness procured at the perfumers. Their costumes, as to architecture, were the latest fashion intensified. They were rainbow-hued. They were hung with jewels, chiefly diamonds. It would have been plain to any eye that it had cost something to upholster these women. The Honorable Mrs. Oliver Higgins was the wife of a delegate from a distant territory, a gentleman 
who had kept the principal saloon and sold the best whiskey in the principal village of his wilderness, and so, of course, was recognized as the first man of his commonwealth and its fittest representative. He was a man of paramount influence at home, for he was public-spirited. He was chief of the fire department. He had an admirable command of profane language and had killed several parties. His shirt fronts were always immaculate, his boots daintily polished, and no man could lift a foot and fire a dead shot at a stray speck of dirt on it with a white handkerchief with a finer grace than he. His watch chain weighed a pound. The gold in his finger ring was worth forty-five dollars. He wore a diamond cluster pin, and he parted his hair behind. He had always been regarded as the most elegant gentleman in his territory, and it was conceded by all that no man thereabouts was anywhere near his equal in the telling of an obscene story except the venerable white-haired governor himself. The Honorable Higgins had not come to serve his country in Washington for nothing. The appropriation which he had engineered through Congress for the maintenance of the Indians in his territory would have made all of those savages rich if it had ever got to them. The Honorable Mrs. Higgins was a picturesque woman and a fluent talker, and she held a tolerably high station among the parvenus. Her English was fair enough, as a general thing, though, being of New York origin, she had the fashion peculiar to many natives of that city of pronouncing saw and law as if they were spelt sar and lar. Petroleum was the agent that had suddenly transformed the Gashleys from modest, hard-working country village folk into loud aristocrats and ornaments of the city. The Honorable Patrick Aurelé was a wealthy Frenchman from Cork. Not that he was wealthy when he first came from Cork, but just the reverse. When he first landed in New York with his wife, he had only halted at Castle Garden for a few minutes to receive and exhibit papers showing that he had resided in this country two years, and then he voted the Democratic ticket and went uptown to hunt a house. He found one, and then went to work as an assistant to an architect and builder, carrying a hod all day and studying politics evenings. Industry and economy soon enabled him to start a low rum shop in a foul locality, and this gave him political influence. In our country, it is always our first care to see that our people have the opportunity of voting for their choice of men to represent and govern them. We do not permit our great officials to appoint the little officials. We prefer to have so tremendous a power as that in our own hands. We hold it safest to elect our judges and everybody else. In our cities, the ward meetings elect delegates to the nominating conventions and instruct them whom to nominate. The publicans and their retainers rule the ward meetings, for everybody else hates the worry of politics and stays at home. The delegates from the ward meetings organize as a nominating convention and make up a list of candidates, one convention offering a Democratic and another a Republican list of incorruptibles. And then the great meek public comes forward at the proper time and make unhampered choice and bless heaven that they live in a free land where no form of despotism can ever intrude. Patrick O'Reilly, as his name then stood, created friends and influence very fast, for he was always on hand at the police courts to give straw bail for his customers or establish an alibi for them in case they had been beating anybody to death on his premises. Consequently, he presently became a political leader and was elected to a petty office under the city government. Out of a meager salary, he soon saved enough money to open quite a stylish liquor saloon higher uptown, with a faro bank attached and plenty of capital to conduct it with. This gave him fame and great respectability. The position of alderman was forced upon him, and it was just the same as presenting him a gold mine. He had fine horses and carriages now, and closed up his whiskey mill. By and by, he became a large contractor for city work, and was a bosom friend of the great and good William M. Weed himself, who had stolen $20,600,000 from the city 
and was a man so envied, so honored, so adored, indeed, that when the sheriff went to his office to arrest him as a felon, the sheriff blushed and apologized, and one of the illustrated papers made a picture of the scene and spoke of the matter in such a way as to show that the editor regretted that the offense of an arrest had been offered to so an exalted a personage as Mr. Weed. Mr. O'Reilly furnished shingle nails to the new courthouse at $3,000 a keg and 18 gross of 60-cent thermometers at $1,500 a dozen. The controller and the board of audit passed the bills, and a mayor, who was simply ignorant but not criminal, signed them. When they were paid, Mr. O'Reilly's admirers gave him a solitaire diamond pin of the size of a filbert, in imitation of the liberality of Mr. Weed's friends, and then Mr. O'Reilly retired from active service and amused himself with buying real estate at enormous figures and holding it in other people's names. By and by the newspapers came out with exposure and called Weed and O'Reilly thieves, whereupon the people rose as one man, voting repeatedly, and elected the two gentlemen to their proper theater of action, the New York legislature. The newspapers clamored, and the courts proceeded to try the new legislators for their small irregularities. Our admirable jury system enabled the persecuted ex-officials to secure a jury of nine gentlemen from a neighboring asylum and three graduates from Sing Sing, and presently they walked forth with characters vindicated. The legislature was called upon to spew them forth, a thing which the legislature declined to do. It was like asking children to repudiate their own father. It was a legislature of the modern pattern. Being now wealthy and distinguished, Mr. O'Reilly, still bearing the legislative honorable attached to his name, for titles never die in America, although we do take a Republican pride in poking fun at such trifles, sailed for Europe with his family. They traveled all about, turning their noses up at everything and not finding it a difficult thing to do, either because nature had originally given these features a cast in that direction, and finally they established themselves in Paris, that paradise of Americans of their sort. They stayed there two years and learned to speak English with a foreign accent, not that it hadn't always had a foreign accent which was indeed the case, but now the nature of it was changed. Finally, they returned home and became ultra-fashionables. They landed here as Honorable Patrick Aurelay and family, and so are known until this day. Laura provided seats for her visitors, and they immediately launched forth into a breezy, sparkling conversation with that easy confidence which is to be found only among persons accustomed to high life. "'I've been intending to call sooner, Miss Hawkins,' said the Honorable Mrs. Aurelay. "'But the weather has been so horrid. How do you like Washington?' Laura liked it very well indeed. Mrs. Gashley, is it your first visit? Yes, it was her first visit. All. Indeed. Mrs. Aurelay, I'm afraid you'll despise the weather, Miss Hawkins. It's perfectly awful. It always is. I tell Mr. Aurelay I can't and I won't put up with any such a climate. If we were obliged to do it, I wouldn't mind it. But we are not obliged to, and so I don't see the use of it. Sometimes it's real pitiful, the way the children pine for Paris. Don't look so sad, Bridget, mon chéri. Poor child, she can't hear Paris mentioned without getting the blues. Mrs. Gashley. Well, I should think so, Mrs. Aurelay. A body lives in Paris, but a body only stays here. I dote on Paris. I'd druther scrimp along on ten thousand dollars a year there than suffer and worry here on a real decent income. Miss Gashley. Well, then, I wish you'd take us back, Mother. I sure hate this stupid country enough, even if it is our dear native land. Miss Emmeline Gashley. What? and leave poor Johnny Peterson behind? An airy, genial laugh applauded this sally. Miss Gashley, sister, I should think you'd be ashamed of yourself. Miss Emmeline, oh, you needn't ruffle your feathers so. 
I was only joking. He don't mean anything by coming to the house every evening, only comes to see Mother. Of course, that's all. General laughter. Miss G., prettily confused. Emmeline, how can you? Mrs. G., let your sister alone, Emmeline. I never saw such a tease. Mrs. Aurelie, what lovely corals you have, Miss Hawkins. Just look at them, Bridget, dear. I've a great passion for corals. It's a pity they're getting a little common. I have some elegant ones, not as elegant as yours, though. But, of course, I don't wear them now. Laura, I suppose they are rather common, but still I have a great affection for these, because they were given to me by a dear old friend of our family named Murphy. He was a very charming man, but very eccentric. We always supposed he was an Irishman, but after he got rich he went abroad for a year or two, and when he came back you would have been amused to see how interested he was in a potato. He asked what it was. Now, you know that when Providence shapes a mouth, especially for the accommodation of a potato, you can detect that fact at a glance when that mouth is in repose. Foreign travel can never remove that sign. But he was a very delightful gentleman, and his little foible did not hurt him at all. We all have our shams. I suppose there is a sham somewhere about every individual, if we could manage to ferret it out. I would so like to go to France. I suppose our society here compares very favorably with French society, does it not, Mrs. Aurelie? Mrs. O. Not by any means, Miss Hawkins. French society is much more elegant, much more so. Laura, I am so sorry to hear that. I suppose ours has deteriorated of late. Mrs. O. Very much indeed. There are people in society here that really have no more money to live on than what some of us pay for servant hire. Still, I won't say what some of them are very good people and respectable, too. Laura. The old families seem to be holding themselves aloof, from what I hear. I suppose you seldom meet in society now the people you used to be familiar with twelve or fifteen years ago. Mrs. O. Oh, no, hardly ever. Mr. O'Reilly kept his first rum mill and protected his customers from the law in those days, and this turn of the conversation was rather uncomfortable to Madame than otherwise. Honorable Mrs. Higgins. Is Francois's health good now, Mrs. Aurelie? Mrs. O., thankful for the intervention. Not very. A body couldn't expect it. He was always delicate, especially his lungs, and this odious climate tells on him strong now after Paris, which is so mild. Mrs. H., I should think so. Husband says Percy'll die if he don't have a change, and so I'm going to swap round a little and see what can be done. I saw a lady from Florida last week, and she recommended Key West. I told her Percy couldn't abide winds, as he was threatened with a pulmonary affection. And then she said, try St. Augustine. It's an awful distance, ten or twelve hundred miles, they say. But then, in a case of this kind, a body can't stand back for trouble, you know. Mrs. O. No, of course, that's off. If Francois don't get better soon, we've got to look out for some other place, or else Europe. We've thought some of the hot springs, but I don't know. It's a great responsibility, and a body wants to go cautious. Is Hildebrand about again, Mrs. Gashley? Mrs. G. Yes, but that's about all. It was indigestion, you know, and it looks as if it was chronic. And you know I do dread dyspepsia. We've all been worried a good deal about him. The doctor recommended baked apple and spoiled meat, and I think it's done him good. It's about the only thing that will stay on his stomach nowadays. We have Dr. Shovel now. Who's your doctor, Mrs. Higgins? Mrs. H. Well, we had Dr. Spooner a good while, but he runs so much to emetics, which I think are weakening, that we changed off and took Dr. Leathers. We like him very much. He has a fine European reputation, too. The first thing he suggested for Percy was to have him taken out in the back yard for an airing every afternoon, with nothing on at all. 
Mrs. O and Mrs. G. What? Mrs. H. As true as I'm sitting here. And it actually helped him for two or three days. It did indeed. But after that, the doctor said it seemed to be too severe. So he fell back on hot foot baths at night and cold showers in the morning. But I don't think there can be any good sound help for him in such a climate as this. I believe we are going to lose him if we don't make a change. Mrs. O. I suppose you heard of the fright we had two weeks ago last Saturday. No? Why, that is strange. But come to remember, you've all been away to Richmond. Francois tumbled from the skylight in the second-story hall clean down to the first floor. Everybody. Mercy. Mrs. O. Yes, indeed. And broke two of his ribs. Everybody. What? Mrs. O. Just as true as you live. First we thought he must be injured internally. It was fifteen minutes past eight in the evening. Of course we were all distracted in a moment. Everybody was flying everywhere. And nobody doing anything worth anything. By and by, I flung out next door and dragged in Dr. Sprague, president of the medical university. No time to go for our own doctor, of course. And the minute he saw Francois, he said, Send for your own physician, madam. Said it as cross as a bear, too, and turned right on his heel and cleared out without doing a thing. Everybody. That mean, contemptible brute. Mrs. O. Well, you may say it. I was nearly out of my wits by this time, but we hurried off the servants after our own doctor and telegraphed mother. She was in New York and rushed down on the first train. And when the doctor got there, lo and behold you, he found that Francois had broken one of his legs, too. Everybody. Goodness. Mrs. O. Yes. So he set his leg and bandaged it up and fixed his ribs, and gave him a dose of something to quiet down his excitement, and put him to sleep. Poor thing, he was trembling and frightened to death, and it was pitiful to see him. We had him in my bed. Mr. Aurelé slept in the guest room, and I laid down beside Francois. But not to sleep, bless you, no. Bridget and I sat up all night, and the doctor stayed till two in the morning, bless his old heart. When mother got there, she was so used up with anxiety that she had to go to bed and have the doctor. But when she found that Francois was not in immediate danger, she rallied, and by night she was able to take a watch herself. Well, for three days and nights we three never left that bedside, only to take an hour's nap at a time. And then the doctor said Francois was out of danger, and if ever there was a thankful set in this world, it was us. Laura's respect for these women had augmented during this conversation, naturally enough. Affection and devotion are qualities that are able to adorn and render beautiful a character that is otherwise unattractive and even repulsive. Mrs. Gashley, I do believe I would have died if I had been in your place, Mrs. Orle. The time Hildebrand was so low with the pneumonia, Emmeline and me were all alone with him most of the time and we never took a minute's sleep for as much as two days and nights. It was at Newport, and we wouldn't trust hired nurses. One afternoon he had a fit, and jumped up and run out on the portico of the hotel, with nothing in the world on, and the wind blowing like an ice, and we after him scared to death. And when the ladies and gentlemen saw that he had a fit, every lady scattered for her room, and not a gentleman lifted his hand to help. The wretches. Well, after that, his life hung by a thread for as much as ten days, and the minute he was out of danger, Emmeline and me just went to bed sick and worn out. I never want to pass through such a time again. Poor dear Francois. Which leg did he break, Mrs. Aurelé? Mrs. O. It was his right hand hind leg. Jump down, Francois, dear, and show the ladies what a cruel limp you've got yet. Francois demurred, but being coaxed and delivered gently upon the floor, he performed very satisfactorily with his right hand hind leg in the air. All were affected, even Laura, but hers was an affection of the stomach. The country-bred girl had not suspected that the little whining ten-ounce black-and-tan reptile, clad in a red-embroidered pygmy blanket, 
and reposing in Mrs. Orelais' lap all through the visit was the individual whose sufferings had been stirring the dormant generosity of her nature. She said, "'Poor little creature, you might have lost him.' Mrs. O. "'Oh, pray don't mention it, Miss Hawkins. It gives me such a turn.' Laura. "'And Hildebrand and Percy. Are they... are they like this one?' Mrs. G. "'No. Hilly has considerable sky blood in him, I believe.' Mrs. H. "'Percy's the same. Only he is two months and ten days older and has his ears cropped. His father, Martin Farquhar Tupper, was sickly and died young. But he was the sweetest disposition. His mother had heart disease, but was very gentle and resigned, and a wonderful ratter. As impossible and exasperating as this conversation may sound to a person who is not an idiot, it is scarcely in any respect an exaggeration of one which one of us actually listened to in an American drawing-room. Otherwise, we could not venture to put such a chapter in a book which professes to deal with social possibilities. The Authors So carried away had the visitors become by their interest attracting to the discussion of family matters that their stay had been prolonged to a very improper and unfashionable length, but they suddenly recollected themselves now and took their departure. Laura's scorn was boundless. The more she thought of these people and their extraordinary talk, the more offensive they seemed to her. And yet she confessed that if one must choose between the two extreme aristocracies, it might be best on the whole, looking at things from a strictly business point of view, to herd with the parvenus. She was in Washington solely to compass a certain matter and to do it at any cost, and these people might be useful to her. While it was plain that her purpose and her schemes for pushing them would not find favor in the eyes of the antiques. If it came to choice, and it might come to that sooner or later, she believed she could come to a decision without much difficulty or many pangs. But the best aristocracy of the three Washington castes, and really the most powerful by far, was that of the middle ground. It was made up of the families of public men from nearly every state in the Union, men who held positions in both the executive and legislative branches of the government, and whose characters had been for years blemishless, both at home and at the capital. These gentlemen and their households were unostentatious people. They were educated and refined. They troubled themselves but little about the two other orders of nobility, but moved serenely in their wide orbit, confident in their own strength and well aware of the potency of their influence. They had no troublesome appearances to keep up, no rivalries which they cared to distress themselves about, no jealousies to fret over. They could afford to mind their own affairs and leave other combinations to do the same or do otherwise, just as they chose. They were people who were beyond reproach, and that was sufficient. Senator Dilworthy never came into collision with any of these factions. He labored for them all and with them all. He said that all men were brethren, and all were entitled to the honest, unselfish help and countenance of a Christian laborer in the public vineyard. Laura concluded, after reflection, to let circumstances determine the course it might be best for her to pursue as regarded the several aristocracies. Now it might occur to the reader that perhaps Laura had been somewhat rudely suggestive in her remarks to Mrs. Orelais when the subject of corals was under discussion, but it did not occur to Laura herself. She was not a person of exaggerated refinement. Indeed, the society and the influences that had formed her character had not been of a nature calculated to make her so. She thought that give and take was fair play and that to parry an offensive thrust with sarcasm was a neat and legitimate thing to do, she sometimes talked to people in a way which some ladies would consider actually shocking. But Laura rather prided herself upon some of her exploits of that character. We are sorry we cannot make her a faultless heroine, but we cannot, for the reason that she was human. She considered herself a superior conversationist. Long ago, 
when the possibility had first been brought before her mind that some day she might move in Washington society, she had recognized the fact that practiced conversational powers would be a necessary weapon in that field. She had also recognized the fact that since her dealings there must be mainly with men, and men whom she supposed to be exceptionally cultivated and able, she would need heavier shot in her magazine than mere brilliant society nothings, whereupon she had at once entered upon a tireless and elaborate course of reading, and had never since ceased to devote every unoccupied moment to this sort of preparation. Having now acquired a happy smattering of various information, she used it with good effect. She passed for a singularly well-informed woman in Washington. The quality of her literary tastes had necessarily undergone constant improvement under this regime, and has necessarily also the duality of her language had improved, though it cannot be denied that now and then her former condition of life betrayed itself in just perceptible inelegancies of expression and lapses of grammar. End of chapter 33 Recording by Richard Kilmer, Rio Medina, Texas Chapter 34 of The Gilded Age This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Richard Kilmer The Gilded Age by Mark Twain and Charles Dudley Warner Chapter 34 When Laura had been in Washington three months, she was still the same person in one respect that she was when she first arrived there. That is to say, she still bore the name of Laura Hawkins. Otherwise, she was perceptibly changed. She had arrived in a state of grievous uncertainty as to what manner of woman she was, physically and intellectually, as compared with Eastern women. She was well satisfied now that her beauty was confessed, her mind a grade above the average, and her powers of fascination rather extraordinary. So she was at ease upon those points. When she arrived, she was possessed of habits of economy, and not possessed of money. Now she dressed elaborately, gave but little thought to the cost of things, and was very well fortified financially. She kept her mother and Washington freely supplied with money, and did the same by Colonel Sellers, who always insisted upon giving his note for loans, with interest. He was rigid upon that. She must take interest and one of the Colonel's greatest satisfactions was to go over his accounts and note what a handsome sum this accruing interest amounted to, and what a comfortable, though modest, support it would yield Laura in case reverses should overtake her. In truth, he could not help feeling that he was an efficient shield for her against poverty, and so if her expensive ways ever troubled him for a brief moment, he presently dismissed the thought and said to himself, Let her go on. Even if she loses everything, she is still safe. This interest will always afford her a good, easy income. Laura was on excellent terms with a great many members of Congress, and there was an undercurrent of suspicion in some quarters that she was one of the detested class known as lobbyists. But what bell could escape the slander in such a city? Fair-minded people declined to condemn her on mere suspicion, and so the injurious talk made no very damaging headway. She was very gay now, and very celebrated, and she might well expect to be assailed by many kinds of gossip. She was growing used to celebrity, and could already sit calm and seemingly unconscious under the fire of fifty laurinettes in a theater, or even overhear the low voice, that's she as she passed along the street without betraying annoyance. The whole air was full of a vague, vast scheme, which was to eventuate in filling Laura's pockets with millions of money. Some had one idea of the scheme, and some another, but nobody had any exact knowledge upon the subject. 
All that anyone felt sure about was that Laura's landed estates were princely in value and extent, and that the government was anxious to get hold of them for public purposes, and that Laura was willing to make the sale, but not at all anxious about the matter, and not at all in a hurry. It was whispered that Senator Dilworthy was a stumbling block in the way of an immediate sale, because he was resolved that the government should not have the lands except with the understanding that they should be devoted to the uplifting of the Negro race. Laura did not care what they were devoted to, it was said. A world of very different gossip, to the contrary notwithstanding. But there were several other heirs, and they would be guided entirely by the Senator's wishes. And finally, many people averred that while it would be easy to sell the lands to the government for the benefit of the Negro, by resorting to the usual methods of influencing votes, Senator Dilworthy was unwilling to have so noble a charity sullied by any taint of corruption. He was resolved that not a vote should be bought. Nobody could get anything definite from Laura about these matters, and so gossip had to feed itself chiefly upon guesses. But the effect of it all was that Laura was considered to be very wealthy, and likely to be vastly more so in a little while. Consequently, she was much courted, and as much envied. Her wealth attracted many suitors. Perhaps they came to worship her riches, but they remained to worship her. Some of the noblest men of the time succumbed to her fascinations. She frowned upon no lover when he made his first advances, but by and by, when she was hopelessly enthralled, he learned from her own lips that she had formed a resolution never to marry. Then he would go away hating and cursing the whole sex, and she would calmly add his scalp to her string, while she mused upon the bitter day that Colonel Selby trampled her love and her pride in the dust. In time it came to be said that her way was paved with broken hearts. Poor Washington gradually woke up to the fact that he too was an intellectual marvel, as well as his gifted sister. He could not conceive how it had come about. It did not occur to him that gossip about his family's great wealth had anything to do with it. He could not account for it by any process of reasoning, and was simply obliged to accept the fact and give up trying to solve the riddle. He found himself dragged into society and courted. Wondered at and envied very much as if he were one of those foreign barbers who flit over here now and then with a self-conferred title of nobility and marry some rich fool's absurd daughter. Sometimes at a dinner party or a reception he would find himself the center of interest and feel unutterably uncomfortable in the discovery. Being obliged to say something, he would mine his brain and put in a blast, and when the smoke and flying debris had cleared away, the result would be what seemed to him but a poor little intellectual clod of dirt or two, and then he would be astonished to see everybody as lost in admiration as if he had brought up a ton or two of virgin gold. Every remark he made delighted his hearers and compelled their applause. He overheard people say he was exceedingly bright. They were chiefly mamas and marriageable young ladies. He found that some of his good things were being repeated about the town. Whenever he heard of an instance of this kind, he would keep that particular remark in mind and analyze it at home in private. At first he could not see that the remark was anything better than a parrot might originate, but by and by he began to feel that perhaps he underrated his powers, and after that he used to analyze his good things with a deal of comfort, and find in them a brilliancy which would have been unapparent to him in earlier days, and then he would make a note of that good thing and say it again the first time he found himself in a new company. Presently he had saved up quite a repertoire of brilliancies, and after that he confined himself to repeating these and ceased to originate any more, lest he might injure his reputation by an unlucky effort. He was constantly having young ladies thrust upon his notice at receptions, and left upon his hands at parties and in time he began to feel that he was being deliberately persecuted in this way, 
and after that he could not enjoy society because of his constant dread of these female ambushes and surprises. He was distressed to find that nearly every time he showed a young lady a polite attention, he was straightway reported to be engaged to her, and as some of these reports got into the newspapers occasionally, he had to keep writing Louise that they were lies and she must believe in him and not mind them or allow them to grieve her. Washington was as much in the dark as anybody with regard to the great wealth that was hovering in the air and seemingly on the point of tumbling into the family pocket. Laura would give him no satisfaction. All she would say was, Wait, be patient. You will see. But will it be soon, Laura? It will not be very long, I think. But what makes you think so? I have reasons and good ones. Just wait and be patient. But is it going to be as much as people say it is? What do they say it is? Oh, ever so much. Millions. Yes, it will be a great sum. But how great, Laura? Will it be millions? Yes, you may call it that. Yes, it will be millions. There. Now, does that satisfy you? Splendid. I can wait. I can wait patiently, ever so patiently. Once I was near selling the land for $20,000 once for $30,000, once after that for $7,000, and once for $40,000, but something always told me not to do it. What a fool I would have been to sell it for such a beggarly trifle. It is the land that's to bring the money, isn't it, Laura? You can tell me that much, can't you? Yes, I don't mind saying that much. It is the land. But mind, don't ever hint that you got it from me. Don't mention me in the matter at all, Washington." All right, I won't. Millions. Isn't it splendid? I mean, to look around for a building lot, a lot with fine ornamental shrubbery, and all that sort of thing. I will do it today, and I might as well see an architect, too, and get him to go to work at a plan for a house. I don't intend to spare any expense. I mean to have the noblest house that money can build. Then, after a pause, he did not notice Laura's smiles. Laura, would you lay the main hall in encaustic tiles, or just in fancy patterns of hard wood. Laura laughed a good old-fashioned laugh that had more of her former natural self in it than any sound that had issued from her mouth in many weeks. She said, You don't change, Washington. You still begin to squander a fortune right and left the instant you hear of it in the distance. You never wait till the foremost dollar of it arrives within a hundred miles of you and she kissed her brother good-bye and left him weltering in his dreams, so to speak. He got up and walked the floor feverishly during two hours. When he sat down, he had married Louise, built a house, reared a family, married them off, spent upwards of $800,000 on mere luxuries, and died worth 12 millions. End of chapter 34 Recording by Richard Kilmer Rio Medina, Texas. Chapter 35 of The Gilded Age. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Gilded Age by Mark Twain and Charles Dudley Warner. Chapter 35. Laura went downstairs, knocked at the study door, and entered, scarcely waiting for the response. Senator Dilworthy was alone, with an open Bible in his hand, upside down. Laura smiled and said, forgetting her acquired correctness of speech, It is only me. Ah, come in, sit down, and the senator closed the book and laid it down. I wanted to see you. Time to report progress from the Committee of the Whole, and the senator beamed with his own congressional wit. In the Committee of the Whole, things are working very well. We have made ever so much progress in a week. I believe that you and I together could run this government beautifully, Uncle. The Senator beamed again. He liked to be called Uncle by this beautiful woman. Did you see Hopperson last night after the Congressional prayer meeting? Yes, he came. He's a kind of... Eh? He is one of my friends, Laura. He's a fine man. A very fine man. I don't know any man in Congress I'd sooner go to for help in any Christian work. What did he say? Oh, he beat around a little. He said he should like to help the Negro. His heart went out to the Negro and all that. Plenty of them say that, but he was a little afraid of the Tennessee land bill. 
If Senator Dilworthy wasn't in it, he should suspect there was a fraud on the government. He said that, did he? Yes, and he said he felt he couldn't vote for it. He was shy. Not shy, child, cautious. He's a very cautious man. I have been with him a great deal on conference committees. He wants reasons, good ones. Didn't you show him he was in error about the bill? I did. I went over the whole thing. I had to tell him some of the side arrangements, some of the... You didn't mention me. Oh, no, I told him you were daft about the Negro and the philanthropy part of it, as you are. Daft is a little strong, Laura, but you know that I wouldn't touch this bill if it were not for the public good and for the good of the colored race, much as I am interested in the heirs of this property and would like to have them succeed. Laura looked a little incredulous, and the senator proceeded. Don't misunderstand me. I don't deny that it is for the interest of all of us that this bill should go through, and it will. I have no concealments from you but I have one principle in my public life which I should like you to keep in mind. It has always been my guide. I never push a private interest if it is not justified and ennobled by some larger public good. I doubt Christian would be justified in working for his own salvation if it was not to aid in the salvation of his fellow men. The senator spoke with feeling, and then added, I hope you showed Hopperson that our motives were pure. Yes, and he seemed to have a new light on the measure. I think we'll vote for it. I hope so. His name will give tone and strength to it. I knew you would only have to show him that it was just and pure in order to secure his cordial support. I think I convinced him. Yes, I am perfectly sure he will vote right now. That's good, that's good, said the senator, smiling and rubbing his hands. Is there anything more? You'll find some changes in that, I guess, handing the senator a printed list of names. Those checked off are all right. Ah, mmm, mmm, running his eye down the list. That's encouraging. What is the C before some of the names, and the B, B? Those are my private marks. That C stands for convinced, with argument. The B, B is a general sign for a relative. You see, it stands before three of the honorable committee. I expect to see the chairman of the committee today, Mr. Buckstone. So you must. He ought to be seen without any delay. Buckstone is a worldly sort of fellow, but he has charitable impulses. If we secure him, we shall have a favorable report by the committee and it will be a great thing to be able to state that fact quietly where it will do good. Oh, I saw Senator Balloon. He will help us, I suppose? Balloon is a whole-hearted fellow. I can't help loving that man for all his drollery and waggishness. He puts on an air of levity sometimes, but there ain't a man in the Senate knows the scriptures as he does. He did not make any objections? Not exactly. He said... Shall I tell you what he said? asked Laura, glancing furtively at him. Certainly. He said he had no doubt it was a good thing. If Senator Dilworthy was in it, it would pay to look into it. The senator laughed, but rather feebly, and said, Balloon is always full of his jokes. I explained it to him. He said it was all right. He only wanted a word with you, continued Laura. He is a handsome old gentleman, and he is gallant for an old man. My daughter, said the senator with a grave look, I trust there was nothing free in his manner. Free, repeated Laura, with indignation in her face. With me? There, there, child, I meant nothing. Balloon talks a little freely sometimes, with men, but he is right at heart. His term expires next year, and I fear we shall lose him. He seemed to be packing the day I was there. His rooms were full of dry goods boxes, into which his servant was crowding all manner of old clothes and stuff. I suppose he will paint pub docks on them and frank them home. That's good economy, isn't it? Yes, yes, but, child, all congressmen do that. It may not be strictly honest. Indeed, it is not unless he had some public documents mixed in with the clothes. It's a funny world. Goodbye, Uncle. I'm going to see that chairman. And humming a cheery opera air, she departed to her room to dress for going out. Before she did that, however, she took out her notebook and was soon deep in its contents, marking, dashing, erasing, figuring, and talking to herself. Free. I wonder what Dilworthy does think of me anyway. One, two... Eight, seventeen, twenty-one. Mm -hmm. It takes a heap for a majority. Wouldn't Dilworthy open his eyes if he knew some of the things Balloon did say to me? There. Hopperson's influence ought to count twenty. The sanctimonious old curmudgeon. Son-in-law. Sinecure in the Negro institution. That about gauges him. The three committee men. Sons-in-law. Nothing like a son-in-law here in Washington or a brother-in-law. And everybody has him. Let's see. Sixty-one. With places. Twenty-five. Persuaded. It is getting on. We'll have two-thirds of Congress in time. Dilworthy must surely know I understand him. Uncle Dilworthy. Uncle Balloon. 
tells very amusing stories when ladies are not present. I should think so. Mm. Mm. Eighty-five. There, I must find that chairman. Queer. Buckstone X. Seemed to be in love. I was sure of it. He promised to come here, and he hasn't. Strange. Very strange. I must chance to meet him today. Laura dressed and went out, thinking she was perhaps too early for Mr. Buckstone to come from the house, but as he lodged near the bookstore, she would drop in there and keep a lookout for him. While Laura is on her errand to find Mr. Buckstone, it may not be out of the way to remark that she knew quite as much of Washington life as Senator Dilworthy gave her credit for, and more than she thought proper to tell him. She was acquainted by this time with a good many of the young fellows of Newspaper Row, and exchanged gossip with them to their mutual advantage. They were always talking in the row, everlastingly gossiping, bantering, and sarcastically praising things, and going on in a style which was a curious commingling of earnest and persiflage. Colonel Sellers liked this talk amazingly, though he was sometimes a little at sea in it, and perhaps that didn't lessen the relish of the conversation to the correspondents. It seems that they had got hold of the dry goods box packing story about balloon one day, and were talking it over when the colonel came in. The colonel wanted to know all about it, and Hicks told him, and then Hicks went on with a serious air. Colonel, if you register a letter, it means that it is of value, doesn't it? And if you pay fifteen cents for registering it, the government will have to take extra care of it and even pay you back its full value if it is lost. Isn't that so? Yes, I suppose it's so. Well, Senator Balloon put fifteen cents worth of stamps on each of those seven huge boxes of old clothes and shipped that ton of second-hand rubbish, old boots and pantaloons and what not through the mails as registered matter. It was an ingenious thing, and it had a genuine touch of humor about it, too. I think there's more real talent among our public men of today than there was among those of old times. A far more fertile fancy, a much happier ingenuity. Now, Colonel, can you picture Jefferson, or Washington, or John Adams franking their wardrobes through the mails, and adding the facetious idea of making the government responsible for the cargo for the sum of one dollar and five cents? Statesmen were dull creatures in those days. I have a much greater admiration for Senator Balloon. Yes, Balloon is a man of parts. There's no denying it. I think so. He is spoken of for the post of minister to China, or Austria, and I hope will be appointed. What we want abroad is good examples of the national character. John Jay and Benjamin Franklin were well enough in their day, but the nation has made progress since then. Balloon is a man we know and can depend on to be true to himself. Yes, and Balloon has had a good deal of public experience. He is an old friend of mine. He was governor of one of the territories a while, and was very satisfactory. Indeed he was. He was ex officio an Indian agent, too. Many a man would have taken the Indian appropriation and devoted the money to feeding and clothing the helpless savages whose land had been taken from them by the white man in the interests of civilization, but Balloon knew their needs better. He built a government sawmill on the reservation with the money, and the lumber sold for enormous prices. A relative of his did all the work free of charge. That is to say, he charged nothing more than the lumber would bring. But the poor engines, not that I care much for engines, what did he do for them? Gave them the outside slabs to fence in the reservation with. Governor Balloon was nothing less than a father to the poor Indians, but Balloon is not alone. We have many truly noble statesmen in our country service like Balloon. The Senate is full of them. Don't you think so, Colonel? Well, I don't know. I honor my country's public servants as much as anyone can. I meet them, sir, every day, and the more I see of them the more I esteem them, and the more grateful I am that our institutions give us the opportunity of securing their services. Few lands are so blessed. That is true, Colonel. To be sure, you can buy now and then a senator or a representative, but they do not know it is wrong, and so they are not ashamed of it. They are gentle and confiding and childlike, and in my opinion, these are qualities that ennoble them far more than any amount of sinful sagacity should. I quite agree with you, Colonel Sellers. Well, hesitated the Colonel, I am afraid some of them do buy their seats. Yes, I am afraid they do. But, as Senator Dilworthy himself said to me, it is sinful. It is very wrong. It is shameful. Heaven protect me from such a charge. That is what Dilworthy said. And yet, when you come to look at it, you cannot deny that we would have to go without the services of some of our ablest men, sir, if the country were opposed to... to bribery. It is a harsh term. I do not like to use it. The colonel interrupted himself at this point to meet an engagement with the Austrian minister, and took his leave with his usual courtly bow. End of chapter 35 Read by Richard Wallace, Liberty, Missouri, 
August 11th, 2010. Chapter 36 of The Gilded Age. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Gilded Age by Mark Twain and Charles Dudley Warner. Chapter 36. In due time, Laura alighted at the bookstore and began to look at the titles of the handsome array of books on the counter. A dapper clerk of perhaps nineteen or twenty years, with hair accurately parted and surprisingly slick, came bustling up and leaned over with a pretty smile and an affable, Can I, was there any particular book you wish to see? Have you Taine's England? Beg pardon? Taine's Notes on England. The young gentleman scratched the side of his nose with a cedar pencil, which he took down from its bracket on the side of his head, and reflected a moment. Ah, I see, with a bright smile. Train, you mean, not Taine. George Francis Train. No, ma'am, we... I mean Taine, if I may take the liberty. The clerk reflected again, then... Taine. Taine. Is it hymns? No, it isn't hymns. It is a volume that is making a deal of talk just now, and is very widely known, except among parties who sell it. The clerk glanced at her face to see if a sarcasm might not lurk somewhere in that obscure speech, but the gentle simplicity of the beautiful eyes that met his banished that suspicion. He went away and conferred with the proprietor. Both appeared to be nonplussed. They thought and talked and talked and thought by turns. Then both came forward, and the proprietor said, is it an American book, ma'am? No, it is an American reprint of an English translation. Oh, yes, yes, I remember now. We are expecting it every day. It isn't out yet. I think you must be mistaken, because you advertised it a week ago. Why, no, can that be so? Yes, I am sure of it. And besides, here is the book itself on the counter. She bought it, and the proprietor retired from the field. Then she asked the clerk for the autocrat of the breakfast table, and was pained to see the admiration her beauty had inspired in him fade out of his face. He said with cold dignity that cookbooks were somewhat out of their line, but he would order it if she desired. She said, no, never mind. Then she fell to conning the titles again, finding a delight in the inspection of the Hawthorns, the Longfellows, the Tennysons, and other favorites of her idle hours. Meanwhile, the clerk's eyes were busy, and no doubt his admiration was returning again, or maybe he was only gauging her probable literary tastes by some sagacious system of admeasurement only known to his guild. Now he began to assist her in making a selection, but his efforts met with no success. Indeed, they only annoyed her and unpleasantly interrupted her meditations. Presently, while she was holding a copy of Venetian Life in her hand and running over a familiar passage here and there, the clerk said briskly, snatching up a paper-covered volume and striking the counter a smart blow with it to dislodge the dust. Now, here is a work that we've sold a lot of. Everybody that read it likes it. And he intruded it under her nose. It's a book that I can recommend, The Pirate's Doom, or The Last of the Buccaneers. I think it's one of the best things that came out this season. Laura pushed it gently aside her hand and went on at filching from Venetian life. I believe I do not want it, she said. The clerk hunted around a while, glancing at one title and then another, but apparently not finding what he wanted. However, he succeeded at last. Said he, Have you ever read this, ma'am? I'm sure you'll like it. It's by the author of The Hooligans of Hackensack. It is full of love troubles and mysteries and all sorts of such things. The heroine strangles her own mother. Just glance at the title, please. Gondoril the Vampire, or The Dance of Death. And here is The Jokist's Own Treasury, or The Funny Fellow's Bosom Friend. The funniest thing. I've read it four times, ma'am, and I can laugh at the very sight of it. And Gondoril, I assure you it is the most splendid book I ever read. I know you will like these books, ma'am, because I've read them myself and I know what they are. Oh, I was perplexed, but I see how it is now. You must have thought I asked you to tell me what sorts of books I wanted, for I am apt to say things which I don't really mean when I am absent-minded. I suppose I did ask you, didn't I? No, ma'am, but I... Yes, I must have done it, else you would not have offered your services for fear it might be rude. But don't be troubled. It was all my fault. I ought not to have been so heedless. I ought not to have asked you. But you didn't ask me, ma'am. We always help customers all we can. You see, our experience, living right among books all the time, that sort of thing makes us able to help a customer make a selection, you know. Now, does it indeed? It is part of your business, then? 
Yes, and we always help. How good it is of you. Some people would think it rather obtrusive, perhaps, but I don't. I think it is real kindness, even charity. Some people jump to conclusions without any thought. Have you noticed that? Oh, yes, said the clerk, a little perplexed, as to whether to feel comfortable or the reverse. Oh, yes, indeed, I have often noticed that, ma'am. Yes, they jump to conclusions with an absurd heedlessness. Now, some people would think it odd that because you, with the budding tastes and the innocent enthusiasms natural to your time of life, enjoyed the vampires and the volume of nursery jokes, you should imagine that an older person would delight in them, too. But I do not think it odd at all. I think it natural, perfectly natural in you, and kind, too. You look like a person who not only finds a deep pleasure in any little thing in the way of literature that strikes you forcibly, but is willing and glad to share that pleasure with others, and that, I think, is noble and admirable. Very noble and admirable. I think we ought all to share our pleasures with others, and do what we can to make each other happy. Do not you? Oh, yes. Oh, yes, indeed. Yes, you are quite right, ma'am. But he was getting unmistakably uncomfortable now, notwithstanding Laura's confiding sociability and almost affectionate tone. Yes, indeed. Many people would think that what a bookseller, or perhaps his clerk, knows about literature as literature, in contradistinction to its character as merchandise, would hardly be of much assistance to a person, that is, to an adult, of course, in the selection of food for the mind, except, of course, wrapping paper or twine or wafers or something like that, but I never feel that way. I feel that whatever service you offer me, you offer with a good heart, and I am as grateful for it as if it were the greatest boon to me, and it is useful to me, it is bound to be so. It cannot be otherwise. If you show me a book which you have read, not skimmed over or merely glanced at, but read, and you tell me that you enjoyed it, and that you could read it three or four times, then I know what book I want. Thank you. Th to avoid. Yes, indeed. I think that no information ever comes amiss in this world. Once or twice I have traveled in the cars, and there, you know, the peanut boy always measures you with his eye, and hands you out a book of murders if you are fond of theology, or Tupper or Dictionary or T.S. Arthur if you are fond of poetry, or he hands you a volume of distressing jokes or a copy of the American Miscellany if you particularly dislike that sort of literary fatty degeneration of the heart, just for the world like a pleasant-spoken, well-meaning gentleman in any bookstore. But here I am running on as if businessmen had nothing to do but listen to women talk. You must pardon me, for I was not thinking, and you must let me thank you again for helping me. I read a good deal, and shall be in nearly every day, and I would be sorry to have you think me a customer who talks too much and buys too little. Might I ask you to give me the time? Ah, 2.22. Thank you very much. I will set mine while I have the opportunity. But she could not get her watch open, apparently. She tried, and tried again. Then the clerk, trembling at his own audacity, begged to be allowed to assist. She allowed him. He succeeded, and was radiant under the sweet influences of her pleased face and her seductively worded acknowledgments with gratification. Then he gave her the exact time again, and anxiously watched her turn the hand slowly till they reached the precise spot without accident or loss of life, and then he looked as happy as a man who had helped a fellow being through a momentous undertaking, and was grateful to know that he had not lived in vain. Laura thanked him once more. The words were music to his ear, but what were they compared to the ravishing smile with which she flooded his whole system? When she bowed her adieu and turned away, he was no longer suffering torture in the pillory where she had had him trussed up during so many distressing moments, but he belonged to the list of her conquests, and was a flattered and happy thrall, with the dawnlight of love breaking over the eastern elevations of his heart. It was about the hour now for the chairman of the House Committee on Benevolent Appropriations to make his appearance, and Laura stepped to the door to reconnoiter. She glanced up the street, and sure enough. End of chapter 36 Read by Richard Wallace, Liberty, Missouri 11 August 2010
I have been married once, is that nothing in my favor? Oh, yes. That is, it may be and it may not be. If you have known what perfection is in woman, it is fair to argue that inferiority cannot interest you now. Even if that were the case, it could not affect you, Miss Hawkins, said the chairman gallantly. Fame does not place you in the list of ladies who rank below perfection. This happy speech delighted Mr. Buckstone as much as it seemed to delight Laura, but it did not confuse him as much as it apparently did her. I wish in all sincerity that I could be worthy of such a felicitous compliment as that, but I am a woman, and so I am gratified, for it is just as it is, and would not have it altered. But it is not merely a compliment, that is, an empty compliment, it is the truth. All men will endorse that. Laura looked pleased, and said, It is very kind of you to say it. It is a distinction, indeed, for a country-bred girl like me to be so spoken of by people of brains and culture. You are so kind that I know you will pardon my putting you to the trouble to come this evening. Indeed, it was no trouble. It was a pleasure. I am alone in the world since I lost my wife, and I often long for the society of your sex, Miss Hawkins, notwithstanding what people may say to the contrary. It is pleasant to hear you say that. I am sure it must be so. If I feel lonely at times, because of my exile from old friends, although surrounded by new ones who are already very dear to me, how much more lonely must you feel, bereft as you are, and with no wholesome relief from the cares of state that weigh you down. For your own sake, as well as for the sake of others, you ought to go into society oftener. I seldom see you at a reception, and when I do, you do not usually give me very much of your attention. I never imagined that you wished it, or I would have been very glad to make myself happy in that way. But one seldom gets an opportunity to say more than a sentence to you in a place like that. You are always down the center of a group, a fact which you may have noticed yourself. But if one might come here, indeed you would always find a hearty welcome, Mr. Buckstone. I have often wished you would come and tell me more about Cairo and the pyramids, as you once promised me you would. Why, do you remember that yet, Miss Hawkins? I thought ladies' memories were more fickle than that. Oh, they are not so fickle as gentlemen's promises. And besides, if I had been inclined to forget, I... Did you not give me something by way of a remembrancer? Did I? Think. It does seem to me that I did, but I have forgotten what it was now. Never, never call a lady's memory fickle again. Do you recognize this? A little spray of box. I am beaten. I surrender. But have you kept that all this time? Laura's confusion was very pretty. She tried to hide it, but the more she tried, the more manifest it became, and withal the more captivating to look upon. Presently she threw the spray of box from her with an annoyed air and said, I forgot myself. I have been very foolish. I beg that you will forget this absurd thing. Mr. Buckstone picked up the spray, and sitting down by Laura's side on the sofa, said, Please let me keep it, Miss Hawkins. I set a very high value upon it now. Give it to me, Mr. Buckstone, and do not speak so. I have been sufficiently punished for my thoughtlessness. You cannot take pleasure in adding to my distress. Please give it to me. Indeed, I do not wish to distress you, but do not consider the matter so gravely. You have done yourself no wrong. You probably forgot that you had it. But if you had given it to me, I would have kept it, and not forgotten it. Don't talk so, Mr. Buckstone. Give it to me, please, and forget the matter. It would not be kind to refuse, since it troubles you so, and so I restore it. But if you would give me part of it, and keep the rest, so that you might have something to remind you of me when you wish to laugh at my foolishness? Oh, by no means, no. Simply that I might remember that I had once assisted to discomfort you, and be reminded to do so no more. Laura looked up, and scanned his face a moment. She was about to break the twig, but she hesitated, and said, If I were sure that you... She threw the spray away, and continued, This is silly. We will change the subject. No, do not insist. I must have my way in this. Then Mr. Buckstone drew off his forces, and proceeded to make a wily advance upon the fortress under cover of carefully contrived artifices and stratagems of war. But he contended with an alert and suspicious enemy, and so at the end of two hours it was manifest to him that he had made but little progress. Still, he had made some, he was sure of that. Laura sat alone and communed with herself. He is fairly hooked, poor thing. I can play him at my leisure and land him when I choose. He was all ready to be caught days and days ago. I saw that very well. He will vote for our bill, no fear about that. And moreover, he will work for it too before I am done with him. If he had a woman's eyes... He would have noticed that the spray of box had grown three inches since he first gave it to me, but a man never sees anything and never suspects. If I had shown him a whole bush, he would have thought it was the same. 
Well, it is a good night's work. The committee is safe. But this is a desperate game I am playing these days. A wearing, sordid, heartless game. If I lose, I lose everything. Even myself. And if I win the game, will it be worth its cost, after all? I do not know. Sometimes I doubt. Sometimes I half wish I had not begun. But no matter. I have begun. And I will never turn back. Never while I live. Mr. Buckstone indulged in a reverie as he walked homeward. She is shrewd and deep, and plays her cards with considerable discretion, but she will lose for all that. There is no hurry. I shall come out winner, all in good time. She is the most beautiful woman in the world, and she surpassed herself tonight. I suppose I must vote for that bill in the end, maybe. But that is not a matter of much consequence. The government can stand it. She is bent on capturing me, that is plain. But she will find by and by that what she took for a sleeping garrison was an ambuscade. End of chapter 37 Read by Richard Wallace, Liberty, Missouri, 11 August 2010Chapter 38 of The Gilded Age. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by John D. Nugent. The Gilded Age by Mark Twain and Charles Dudley Warner. Chapter 38 now this surprising news caused her to fall in a trance. Life as she were dead, no limbs she could advance. Then her dear brother came, her from the ground he took, and she spake up and said, Oh, my poor heart is broke. From the Bernard Castle Tragedy Don't you think he is distinguished looking? What? That gawky-looking person with Miss Hawkins? There. He's just speaking to Mrs. Schoonmaker. Such high-bred negligence and unconsciousness. Nothing studied. See his fine eyes? Very. They're moving this way now. Maybe he's coming here. But he looks as helpless as a rag-baby. Who is he, Blanche? Who is he? And you've been here a week, Grace, and don't know? He's the catch of the season. That's Washington Hawkins, her brother. No, is it? Very old family. Old Kentucky family, I believe. He's got enormous landed property in Tennessee, I think. The family lost everything, slaves and that sort of thing, you know, in the war. But they have a great deal of land, minerals, mines, and all that. Mr. Hawkins and his sister, too, are very much interested in the amelioration of the condition of the collared race. They have some plan with Senator Dilworthy to convert a large part of their property or something or other for the freedmen. You don't say so. I thought he was some guy from Pennsylvania, but he is different from others. Probably he has lived all his life on his plantation. It was a day reception of Mrs. Representative Schoonmaker, a sweet woman of simple and sincere manners. Her house was one of the most popular in Washington. There were less ostentation there than in some others, and people liked to go there where the atmosphere reminded them of the peace and purity of home. Mrs. Schoonmaker was as natural and unaffected in Washington society as she was in her own New York house, and kept up with the spirit of home life there with her husband and children, and that was the reason, probably, why people of refinement liked to go there. Washington is a microcosm, and one can suit himself with any sort of society within a radius of a mile. To a large portion of the people who frequent Washington or dwell there, the ultra-fashion, the shoddy, the jobbery, are as utterly distasteful as they would be in a refined New England city. Schoonmaker was not exactly a leader in the house, but he was greatly respected for his fine talents and his honesty. No one would have thought of offering to carry National Improvement Director's Relief stock for him. 
These day receptions were attended by more women than men, and those interested in the problem might have studied the costumes of the ladies present in view of this fact to discover whether women dress more for the eyes of women or for the effect upon men. It is a very important problem and has been a good deal discussed, and its solution would form one fixed philosophical basis upon which to estimate women's character. We are inclined to take a medium ground and aver that women dresses to please herself and in obedience to a law of her own nature. They're coming this way, said Blanche. People who made way for them to pass turned to look at them. Washington began to feel that the eyes of the public were on him also, and his eyes rolled about, now toward the ceiling, now toward the floor, in an effort to look unconscious. Good morning, Miss Hawkins. Delighted. Mr. Hawkins, my friend, Miss Medlar. Mr. Hawkins, who was endeavoring to square himself for a bow, put his foot through the train of Mrs. Senator Poplin, who looked round with a scowl, which turned into a smile as she saw who it was. In extricating himself, Mr. Hawkins, who had the care of his hat as well as the introduction on his mind, shambled against Miss Blanche, who said pardon, with the prettiest accent, as if the awkwardness were her own, and Mr. Hawkins righted himself. "'Don't you find it very warm today, Mr. Hawkins?' said Blanche, by way of a remark. "'It's awful hot,' said Washington. "'It's warm for the season,' continued Blanche pleasantly. "'But I suppose you are accustomed to it,' she added, with a general idea that the thermometer always stands at ninety degrees in all parts of the late slave states. "'Washington weather generally cannot be very congenial to you.' "'It's congenial,' said Washington, brightening up, "'when it's not congealed. "'That's very good. "'Did you hear, Grace? "'Mr. Hawkins says it's congenial when it's not congealed. "'What is it, dear?' said Grace, who was talking with Laura. "'The conversation was now finally under way. "'Washington launched out an observation of his own. "'Did you see those Japs, Mrs. Leavitt? "'Oh, yes, aren't they queer?' but so high-bred, so picturesque. Do you think that collar makes any difference, Mr. Hawkins? I used to be so prejudiced against collar. Did you? I never was. I used to think my old mammy was handsome. How interesting your life must have been. I should like to hear about it. Washington was about settling himself into his narrative style when Mrs. General Finagle caught his eye. "'Have you been at the Capitol today, Mr. Hawkins?' Washington had not. "'Is anything uncommon going on? They say it was very exciting, the Alabama business, you know. General Sutler of Massachusetts defied England, and they say he wants war.' He wants to make himself conspicuous, more like, said Laura. He always, you have noticed, talks with one eye on the gallery, while the other is on the speaker. Well, my husband says it's nonsense to talk of war, and wicked. He knows what war is. If we do have war, I hope it will be for the patriots of Cuba. Don't you think we want Cuba, Mr. Hawkins? I think we want it bad, said Washington and Santo Domingo. Senator Dilworthy says we are bound to extend our religion over the Isles of the Sea. We've got to round out our territory, and Washington's further observations were broken off by Laura, who whisked him off to another part of the room, and reminded him that they must make their adieu. How stupid and tiresome these people are, she said. Let's go. They were turning to say good-bye to the hostess when Laura's attention was arrested by the sight of a gentleman who was just speaking to Mrs. Schoonmacher. For a second her heart stopped beating. He was a handsome man of forty and perhaps more, with grayish hair and whiskers, 
and he walked with a cane as if he were slightly lame. He might be less than forty, for his face was worn into hard lines, and he was pale. No, it could not be, she said to herself. It is only a resemblance. But as the gentleman turned and she saw his full face, Laura put out her hand and clutched Washington's arm to prevent herself from falling. Washington, who was not minding anything as usual, looked around in wonder. Laura's eyes were blazing fire and hatred. He had never seen her look so before, and her face was livid. Why, what is it, sis? Your face is as white as paper. It's he. It's he. Come, come. And she dragged him away. It's who? asked Washington, when they had gained the carriage. It's nobody. It's nothing. Did I say he? I, I was faint with the heat. Don't mention it. Don't you speak of it, she added earnestly, grasping his arm. When she had gained her room, she went to the glass and saw a pallid and haggard face. My God, she cried, this will never do. I should have killed him if I could. The scoundrel still lives and dares to come here. I ought to kill him. He has no right to live how I hate him, and yet I loved him. Oh, heavens, how I did love that man! And why didn't he kill me? He might better. He did kill all that was good in me. Oh, but he shall not escape. He shall not escape this time. He may have forgotten. He will find that a woman's hate doesn't forget. The law? What would the law do but protect him and make me an outcast? How all Washington would gather up its virtuous skirts and avoid me if it knew. I wonder if he hates me as I do him. So Laura raved, in tears and in rage by turns, tossed off in a tumult of passion, which she gave way to with little effort to control. A servant came to summon her to dinner. She had a headache. The hour came for the President's reception. She had a raving headache, and the Senator must go without her. That night of agony was like another night, she recalled. How vividly it all came back to her. And at that time she remembered she thought she might be mistaken. He might come back to her. Perhaps he loved her a little, after all. Now she knew he did not. Now she knew he was a cold-blooded scoundrel without pity. Never a word in all these years. She had hoped he was dead. Did his wife live, she wondered? She caught at that, and it gave a new current to her thoughts. Perhaps, after all, she must see him. She could not live without seeing him. Would he smile as in the old days when she loved him so, or would he sneer as when she last saw him? If he looked so, she hated him. If he, if he should call her Laura, darling, and look so, she must find him. She must end her doubts. Laura kept her room for two days, on one excuse and another, a nervous headache, a cold, to the great anxiety of the senator's household. Callers, who went away, said she had been too gay. They did not say fast, though some of them may have thought it. One so conspicuous and successful in society as Laura could not be out of the way in two days, without remarks being made, and not all of them complimentary. When she came down, she appeared as usual, a little pale maybe, but unchanged in manner. If there were any deepened lines about the eyes, they had been concealed. Her course of action was quite determined. At breakfast she asked if any one had heard any unusual noise during the night. Nobody had. Washington never heard any noise of any kind after his eyes were shut. Some people thought he never did when they were open, either. Senator Dilworthy said he had come in late. He was detained in a little consultation after the Congressional prayer meeting. Perhaps it was his entrance. 
No, Laura said. She heard that. It was later. She might have been nervous, but she fancied somebody was trying to get into the house. Mr. Briarly humorously suggested that it might be, as none of the members were occupied in night session. The senator frowned, and said he did not like to hear that kind of newspaper slang. There might be burglars about. Laura said that it was very likely it was only her nervousness. <clears throat> but she thought she would feel safer if Washington would let her take one of his pistols. Washington brought her one of his revolvers and instructed her in the art of loading and firing it. During the morning, Laura drove down to Mrs. Schoonmacher's to play a friendly call. "'Your receptions are always delightful,' she said to that lady. "'The pleasant people all seem to come here.' It's pleasant to hear you say so, Miss Hawkins. I believe my friends like to come here. Though society in Washington is mixed, we have a little of everything. I suppose, though, you don't see much of the old rebel element, said Laura with a smile. If this seemed to Mrs. Schoonmacher a singular remark for a lady to make, who was meeting rebels in society every day, she did not express it in any way, but only said, you know we don't say rebel any more. Before we came to Washington, I thought rebels would look unlike other people. I find we are very much alike, and that kindness and good nature wear away prejudice. And then, you know, there are all sorts of common interests. My husband sometimes says that he doesn't see but Confederates are just as eager to get at the Treasury as Unionists. You know that Mr. Schoonmacher is on the appropriations. Does he know many Southerners? Oh, yes. There were several at my reception the other day. Among others, a Confederate colonel, a stranger, handsome man with gray hair. Probably you didn't notice him. Uses a cane and walking. A very agreeable man. I wondered why he called. When my husband came home and looked over the cards, he said he had a cotton claim, a real southerner. Perhaps you might know him if I could think of his name. Yes, here's his card. Louisiana. Laura took the card, looked at it intently till she was sure of the address, and then laid it down with, No, he is no friend of ours. That afternoon... Laura wrote and dispatched the following note. It was in a round hand, unlike her flowing style, and it was directed to a number and street in Georgetown. A lady at Senator Dilworthy's would like to see General George Selby on business connected with the cotton claims. Can he call Wednesday at 3 o'clock p.m.? On Wednesday at 3 p.m.? No one of the family was likely to be in the house except Lara. End of chapter 38 Recording by John D. Nugent in Van Nuys, California Website www.creativehorizonsagency.org Chapter 39 of The Gilded Age This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by John D. Nugent The Gilded Age by Mark Twain and Charles Dudley Warner Chapter 39 Colonel Selby had just come to Washington and taken lodgings in Georgetown. His business was to get pay for some cotton that was destroyed during the war. There were many others in Washington on the same errand, some of them with claims as difficult to establish as his. A concert of action was necessary, and he was not, therefore, at all surprised to receive the note from a lady asking him to call at Senator Dilworthy's. 
At a little after three on Wednesday, he rang the bell of the senator's residence. It was a handsome mansion on the square opposite the president's house. The owner must be a man of great wealth, the colonel thought. Perhaps, who knows, said he with a smile, he may have got some of my cotton in exchange for salt and quinine after the capture of New Orleans. As this thought passed through his mind, he was looking at the remarkable figure of the hero of New Orleans, holding itself by main strength from sliding off the back of the rearing bronze horse, and lifting its hat in the manner of one who acknowledges the playing of that martial air, see the conquering hero clums. Gad, said the colonel to himself, old Hickory ought to get down and give his seat to General Sutler, but they'd have to tie him on. Laura was in the drawing-room. She heard the bell, she heard the steps in the hall, and the emphatic thud of the supporting cane. She had risen from her chair and was leaning against the piano, pressing her left hand against the violent beating of her heart. The door opened, and the colonel entered, standing in the full light of the opposite window, Laura was more in the shadow and stood for an instant, long enough for the colonel to make the inward observation that she was a magnificent woman. She then advanced a step. Colonel Selby, is it not? The colonel staggered back, caught himself by a chair, and turned toward her a look of terror. Laura, my God, yes, your wife. Oh, no, it can't be. How came you here? I thought you were... You thought I was dead? You thought you were rid of me? Not so long as you live, Colonel Selby, not so long as you live. Laura, in her passion, was hurried on to say. No man had ever accused Colonel Selby of cowardice, but he was a coward before this woman. Maybe he was not the man he once was. Where was his coolness? Where was his sneering, imperturbable manner, with which he could have met and would have met any woman he had wronged, if he had only been forewarned? He felt now that he must temporize, that he must gain time. There was danger in Laura's tone. There was something frightful in her calmness. Her steady eyes seemed to devour him. "'You have ruined my life,' she said, "'and I was so young.' so ignorant and loved you so. You betrayed me and left me mocking me and trampling me into the dust, a soiled cast-off. You might better have killed me then. Then I should not have hated you. Laura, said the colonel, nerving himself but still pale and speaking appealingly, don't say that. Reproach me. I deserve it. I was a scoundrel. I was everything monstrous. But your beauty made me crazy. You are right. I was a brute in leaving you as I did. But what could I do? I was married and— And your wife still lives? asked Laura, bending a little forward in her eagerness. The colonel noticed the action, and he almost said no, but he thought of the folly of attempting concealment. Yes, she is here. What little collar had wandered back into Laura's face forsook it again? Her heart stood still, her strength seemed going from her limbs. Her last hope was gone. The room swam before her for a moment, and the colonel stepped toward her, but she waved him back, as hot anger again coursed through her veins, and said, And you dare come with her here and tell me of it? Here and mock me with it? And you think I will have it, George? You think I will let you live with that woman? You think I am as powerless as that day I fell dead at your feet? She raged now. She was in a tempest of excitement. And she advanced toward him with a threatening mien. She would kill me if she could, thought the colonel. But he thought at that same moment how beautiful she is. He had recovered his head now. She was lovely when he knew her, then a simple country girl. 
Now she was dazzling, in the fullness of ripe womanhood, a superb creature, with all the fascination that a woman of the world has for such a man as Colonel Selby. Nothing of this was lost on him. He stepped quickly to her, grasped both her hands in his, and said, "'Laura, stop! Think! Suppose I loved you yet. Suppose I hated my fate. What can I do? I am broken by the war. I have lost everything, almost. I had his leaf be dead and done with it.' The colonel spoke with a low, remembered voice that thrilled through Laura. He was looking into her eyes, as he had looked in those old days, when no birds of all those that sang in the groves where they had walked sang a note of warning. He was wounded. He had been punished. Her strength forsook her with her rage, and she sank upon a chair, sobbing. Oh, my God, I thought I hated him. The colonel knelt beside her. He took her hand, and she let him keep it. She looked down into his face with a pitiable tenderness, and said in a weak voice, And do you love me a little? The colonel vowed and protested. He kissed her hand and her lips. He swore his false soul into perdition. She wanted love, this woman. Was not her love for George Selby deeper than any other woman's could be? Had she not a right to him? Did he not belong to her by virtue of her overmastering passion? His wife. She was not his wife except by the law. She could not be. Even with the law she could have no right to stand between two souls that were one. It was an infamous condition in society that George should be tied to her. Laura thought this, believed it, because she desired to believe it. She came to it as an original proposition founded in the requirements of her own nature. She may have heard, doubtless she had, similar theories that were prevalent at the day, theories of the tyranny of marriage and of the freedom of marriage. She had even heard women lecturers say that marriage should only continue so long as it pleased either party to it, for a year, or a month, or a day. She had not given much heed to this, but she saw its justice now in a dash of revealing desire. It must be right. God would not have permitted her to love George Selby as she did, and him to love her, if it was right for society to raise up a barrier between them. He belonged to her. Had he not confessed it himself? Not even the religious atmosphere of Senator Dilworthy's house had been sufficient to instill into Laura that deep Christian principle which had been somehow omitted in her training. Indeed, in that very house, had she not heard women, prominent before the country and besieging Congress, utter sentiments that fully justified the course she was marking out for herself? They were seated now, side by side, talking with more calmness. Laura was happy, or thought she was, but it was that feverish sort of happiness which is snatched out of the black shadow of falsehood, and is at the moment recognized as fleeting and perilous, and indulged tremblingly. She loved. She was loved. That is happiness, certainly. And the black past and the troubled present and the uncertain future could not snatch that from her. What did they say as they sat there? What nothings do people usually say in such circumstances, even if they are three score and ten? It was enough for Laura to hear his voice and be near him. It was enough for him to be near her and avoid committing himself as much as he could. Enough for him was the present also. Had there not always been some way out of such scrapes? And yet Laura could not be quite content without prying into tomorrow. How could the Colonel manage to free himself from his wife? Would it be long? 
Could he not go into some state where it would not take much time? He could not say exactly. That they must think of. That they must talk over. And so on. Did this seem like the damnable plot to Lara against the life, maybe, of a sister, a woman like herself? Probably not. It was right that this man should be hers, and there were some obstacles in the way. That was all. There were as good reasons for bad actions as for good ones, to those who commit them. When one has broken the Tenth Commandment, the others are not of much account. Was it unnatural, therefore, that when George Selby departed, Laura should watch him from the window with an almost joyful heart as he went down the sunny square? I shall see him tomorrow, she said, and the next day, and the next. He is mine now. Damn the woman, said the colonel as he picked his way down the steps. Or, he added, as his thoughts took a new turn, I wish my wife was in New Orleans. End of chapter 39 Recorded by John D. Nugent, Van Nuys, California Business website www.creativehorizonsagency.com Chapter 40 of The Gilded Age. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Piper Hayes. The Gilded Age by Mark Twain and Charles Dudley Warner. Chapter 40 Open Your Ears. For which of you will stop the vent of hearing when loud rumor speaks? I, from the Orient to the drooping West, making the wind my post-horse, still unfold the axe commenced on this ball of earth. Upon my tongue's continual slanders ride, the which in every language I pronounce, stuffing the ears of men with false reports. King Henry IV as may be readily believed colonel beriah sellers was by this time one of the best known men in washington for the first time in his life his talents had a fair field he was now at the centre of the manufacture of gigantic schemes of speculations of all sorts of political and social gossip the atmosphere was full of little and big rumours and of vast undefined expectations Everybody was in haste, too, to push on his private plan, and feverish in his haste, as if in constant apprehension that tomorrow would be judgment day. Work while Congress is in session, said the uneasy spirit, for in the recess there is no work and no device. The colonel enjoyed this bustle and confusion amazingly. He thrived in the air of indefinite expectation. All his own schemes took larger shape and more misty and majestic proportions, and in this congenial air the colonel seemed even to himself to expand into something large and mysterious. If he respected himself before, he almost worshipped Beriah Sellers now as a superior being. If he could have chosen an official position out of the highest, he would have been embarrassed in the selection. The presidency of the Republic seemed too limited and cramped in the constitutional restrictions. If he could have been Grand Lama of the United States, that might have come the nearest to his idea of a position, and next to that he would have luxuriated in the irresponsible omniscience of the special correspondent. Colonel Sellers knew the President very well, and had access to his presence when officials were kept cooling their heels in the waiting-room. The President liked to hear the Colonel talk. His voluble ease was a refreshment after the decorous dullness of men who only talked business and government, and everlastingly expounded their notions of justice and the distribution of patronage. The Colonel was as much a lover of farming and of horses as Thomas Jefferson was. 
he talked to the president by the hour about his magnificent stud and his plantation at hawkeye a kind of principality he represented it he urged the president to pay him a visit during the recess and see his stock farm the president's table is well enough he used to say to the loafers who gathered about him at willard's well enough for a man on salary but god bless my soul i should like him to see a little old-fashioned hospitality open house you know a person seeing me at home might think i paid no attention to what was in the house just let things flow in and out he'd be mistaken what i look to is quality sir the president has variety enough but the quality vegetables of course you can't expect here i'm very particular about mine take celery now there's only one spot in this country where celery will grow but i ain't surprised about the wines i should think they were manufactured in the new york custom house i must send the president some from my cellar i was really mortified the other day at dinner to see black bay leave his standing in the glasses when the colonel first came to washington he had thoughts of taking the mission to constantinople in order to be on the spot to look after the dissemination of his eye-water but as that invention was not yet quite ready the project shrank a little in the presence of faster schemes besides he felt that he could do the country more good by remaining at home he was one of the southerners who were constantly quoted as heartily accepting the situation i'm whipped he used to say with a jolly laugh the government was too many for me i'm cleaned out done for except my plantation and private mansion we played for a big thing and lost it and i don't whine for one i go for putting the old flag on all the vacant lots i said to the president says i grant why don't you take Santo Domingo, annex the whole thing, and settle the bill afterwards? That's my way. I'd take the job to manage Congress. The South would come into it. You've got to conciliate the South, consolidate the two debts, pay em off in greenbacks, and go ahead. That's my notion. Boutwell's got the right notion about the value of paper, but he lacks courage i should like to run the treasury department about six months i'd make things plenty in business look up the colonel had access to the departments he knew all the senators and representatives and especially the lobby he was consequently a great favorite in newspaper row and was often lounging in the offices there dropping bits of private official information which were immediately caught up and telegraphed all over the country but it need to surprise even the colonel when he read it it was embellished to that degree that he hardly recognized it and the hint was not lost on him he began to exaggerate his heretofore simple conversation to suit the newspaper demand people used to wonder in the winters of eighteen seventy blank and eighteen seventy blank where the specials got that remarkable information with which they every morning surprised the country, revealing the most secret intentions of the President and his cabinet, the private thoughts of political leaders, the hidden meaning of every movement. This information was furnished by Colonel Sellers. When he was asked afterwards about the stolen copy of the Alabama Treaty which got into the New York Tribune, he only looked mysterious and said that neither he nor Senator Dilworthy knew anything about it but those whom he was in the habit of meeting occasionally felt almost certain that he did know it must not be supposed that the colonel in his general patriotic labors neglected his own affairs the columbus river navigation scheme absorbed only a part of his time so he was enabled to throw quite a strong reserve force of energy into the tennessee land plan a vast enterprise commensurate with his abilities and in the prosecution of which he was greatly aided by Mr. Henry Brearley, who was buzzing about the capital and the hotels day and night, and making capital for it in some mysterious way. 
"'We must create a public opinion,' said Senator Dilworthy. "'My only interest in it is a public one, "'and if the country wants the institution, Congress will have to yield.' It may have been after a conversation between the Colonel and Senator Dilworthy that the following special dispatch was sent to a New York newspaper. We understand that a philanthropic plan is on foot in relation to the colored race that will, if successful, revolutionize the whole character of Southern industry. An experimental institution is in contemplation in Tennessee which will do for that state what the industrial school at Zurich did for Switzerland. We learn that approaches have been made to the heirs of the late Honorable Silas Hawkins of Missouri, in reference to a lease of a portion of their valuable property in East Tennessee. Senator Dilworthy, it is understood, is inflexibly opposed to any arrangement that will not give the government absolute control private interests must give way to the public good it is to be hoped that colonel sellers who represents the heirs will be led to see the matter in this light when washington hawkins read this dispatch he went to the colonel in some anxiety he was for a lease he didn't want to surrender anything what did he think the government would offer two millions maybe three maybe four said the colonel is worth more than the bank of england if they will not lease said washington let em make it two millions for an undivided half i'm not going to throw it away not the whole of it harry told the colonel that they must drive the thing through he couldn't be dallying round washington when spring opened phil wanted him phil had a great thing on hand up in pennsylvania what is that inquired the colonel always ready to interest himself in anything large a mountain of coal that's all he's going to run a tunnel into it in the spring does he want any capital asked the colonel in the tone of a man who is given to calculating carefully before he makes an investment no old man bolton's behind him he has capital but i judged that he wanted my experience in starting if he wants me tell him i'll come after congress adjourns i should like to give him a little lift he lacks enterprise now about that columbus river he doesn't see his chances but he's a good fellow and you can tell him that sellers won't go back on him by the way asked harry who is that rather handsome party that's hanging round laura i see him with her everywhere at the capitol in the horse cars and he comes to dilworthy's if he weren't lame i should think he was going to run off with her oh that's nothing laura knows her business he has a cotton claim used to be at hawkeye during the war selby's his name was a colonel got a wife and family very respectable people the selby's well that's all right said harry if it's business but if a woman looked at me as i've seen her at selby i should understand it and it's talked about i can tell you jealousy had no doubt sharpened this young gentleman's observation laura could not have treated him with more lofty condescension if she had been the queen of sheba on a royal visit to the great republic and he resented it and was huffy when he was with her and ran her errands and brought her gossip and bragged of his intimacy with the lovely creature among the fellows at newspaper row laura's life was rushing on now in the full stream of intrigue and fashionable dissipation she was conspicuous at the balls of the fastest set and was suspected of being present at those doubtful suppers that began late and ended early if senator dilworthy remonstrated about appearances she had a way of silencing him perhaps she had some hold on him perhaps she was necessary to his plan for ameliorating the condition the tube-colored race she saw colonel selby when the public knew and when it did not know she would see him whatever excuses he made and however he avoided her 
she was urged on by a fever of love and hatred and jealousy which alternately possessed her sometimes she petted him and coaxed him and tried all her fascinations and again she threatened him and reproached him what was he doing why had he taken no steps to free himself why didn't he send his wife home she should have money soon they could go to europe anywhere what did she care for talk and he promised and lied and invented fresh excuses for delay like a cowardly gambler and roué as he was fearing to break with her and half the time unwilling to give her up that woman doesn't know what fear is he said to himself and she watches me like a hawk he told his wife that this woman was a lobbyist whom he had to tolerate and use in getting through his claims and that he should pay her and have done with her when he succeeded End of chapter 40 Chapter 41 of The Gilded Age This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Piper Hayes The Gilded Age by Mark Twain and Charles Dudley Warner Chapter 41 Henry Brearley was at the Dilworthys constantly, and on such terms of intimacy that he came and went without question. The senator was not an inhospitable man. He liked to have guests in his house, and Harry's gay humor and rattling way entertained him, for even the most devout men and busy statesmen must have hours of relaxation. Harry himself believed that he was of great service in the university business, and that the success of the scheme depended upon him to a great degree. He spent many hours in talking it over with the senator after dinner. He went so far as to consider whether it would be worth his while to take the professorship of civil engineering in the new institution. But it was not the senator's society nor his dinners at which this scapegrace remarked that there was too much grace and too little wine, which attracted him to the horse. The fact was the poor fellow hung around there day after day for the chance of seeing Laura for five minutes at a time. For her presence at dinner he would endure the long bore of the senator's talk afterwards, while Laura was off at some assembly, or excused herself on the plea of fatigue. Now and then he accompanied her to some reception, and rarely, on off nights, he was blessed with her company in the parlor, when he sang and was chatty and vivacious, and performed a hundred little tricks of imitation and ventriloquism, and made himself as entertaining as a man could be. It puzzled him not a little that all his fascinations seemed to go for so little with Laura. It was beyond his experience with women. Sometimes Laura was exceedingly kind and petted him a little, and took the trouble to exert her powers of pleasing, and to entangle him deeper and deeper. But this, it angered him afterwards to think, was in private. In public she was beyond his reach, and never gave occasion to the suspicion that she had any affair with him. He was never permitted to achieve the dignity of a serious flirtation with her in public. "'Why do you treat me so?' he once said, reproachfully. "'Treat you how?' asked Laura, in a sweet voice, lifting her eyebrows. "'You know well enough. You let other fellows monopolize you in society, and you are as indifferent to me as if we were strangers. "'Can I help it if they are attentive? Can I be rude? "'But we are such old friends, Mr. Brearley, that I didn't suppose you would be jealous.' I think I must be a very old friend, then, by your conduct towards me. By the same rule, I should judge that Colonel Selby must be very new. Laura looked up quickly, as if about to return an indignant answer to such impertinence, but she only said, Well, what of Colonel Selby, Saucebox? Nothing, probably, you'll care for. Your being with him so much is the town talk, that's all. What do people say? asked Laura, calmly. Oh, they say a good many things. You are offended, though, to have me speak of it? 
not in the least you are my true friend i feel that i can trust you you wouldn't deceive me harry throwing into her eyes a look of trust and tenderness that melted away all his petulance and distrust what do they say some say that you've lost your head about him others that you don't care any more for him than you do for a dozen others but that he is completely fascinated with you and about to desert his wife and others say it is nonsense to suppose you would entangle yourself with a married man and that your intimacy only arises from the matter of the cotton claims for which he wants your influence with dilworthy but you know everybody is talked about more or less in washington i shouldn't care but i wish you wouldn't have so much to do with selby laura continued harry fancying that he was now upon such terms that his advice would be heeded and you believe these slanders i don't believe anything against you laura but colonel selby does not mean you any good i know you wouldn't be seen with him if you knew his reputation do you know him laura asked as indifferently as she could only a little i was at his lodgings in georgetown a day or two ago with colonel sellers sellers wanted to talk with him about some patent remedy he has eye-water or something of that sort which he wants to introduce into europe selby is going abroad very soon laura started in spite of her self-control and his wife does he take his family did you see his wife yes a dark little woman rather worn must have been pretty once though has three or four children one of them a baby they'll all go of course she said she should be glad enough to get away from washington you know selby has got his claim allowed and they say he has had a run of luck lately at morrissey's laura heard all this in a kind of stupor looking straight at harry without seeing him is it possible she was thinking that this base wretch after all his promises will take his wife and children and leave me is it possible the town is saying all these things about me and a look of bitterness coming into her face does the fool think he can escape so you are angry with me laura said harry not comprehending in the least what was going on in her mind angry she said forcing herself to come back to his presence with you oh no i'm angry with the cruel world which pursues an independent woman as it never does a man i'm grateful to you harry i'm grateful to you for telling me of that odious man and she rose from her chair and gave him her pretty hand which the silly fellow took and kissed and clung to and he said many silly things before she disengaged herself gently and left him saying it was time to dress for dinner and harry went away excited and a little hopeful but only a little the happiness was only a gleam which departed and left him thoroughly miserable she never would love him and she was going to the devil besides he couldn't shut his eyes to what he saw nor his ears to what he heard of her what had come over this thrilling young lady killer it was a pity to see such a gay butterfly broken on a wheel was there something good in him after all that had been touched he was in fact madly in love with this woman it is not for us to analyze the passion and say whether it was a worthy one it absorbed his whole nature and made him wretched enough if he deserved punishment what more would you have perhaps this love was kindling a new heroism in him he saw the road on which laura was going clearly enough though he did not believe the worst he heard of her he loved her too passionately to credit that for a moment and it seemed to him that if he could compel her to recognize her position and his own devotion she might love him and that he could save her his love was so far ennobled and become a very different thing from its beginning in hawkeye whether he ever thought that if he could save her from ruin he could give her up himself is doubtful such a pitch of virtue does not occur often in real life especially in such natures as harry's whose generosity and unselfishness were matters of temperament 
rather than habits or principles. He wrote a long letter to Laura, an incoherent, passionate letter, pouring out his love as he could not do in her presence, and warning her as plainly as he dared of the dangers that surrounded her and the risks she ran of compromising herself in many ways. Laura read the letter, with a little sigh, maybe, as she thought of other days, but with contempt also, and she put it into the fire with the thought, they're all alike. Harry was in the habit of writing to Philip freely, and boasting also about his doings, as he could not help doing and remain himself. Mixed up with his own exploits, and his daily triumphs as a lobbyist, especially in the matter of the new university, in which Harry was to have something handsome, were amusing sketches of Washington society, hints about Dilworthy, stories about Colonel Sellers, who had become a well-known character, and wise remarks upon the machinery of private legislation for the public good, which greatly entertained Philip in his convalescence. Laura's name occurred very often in these letters, at first in casual mention as the belle of the season, carrying everything before her with her wit and beauty, and then more seriously, as if Harry did not exactly like so much general admiration of her, and was a little nettled by her treatment of him. This was so different from Harry's usual tone about women that Philip wondered a good deal over it. Could it be possible that he was seriously affected? Then came stories about Laura. Town talk, gossip which Harry denied the truth of indignantly. But he was evidently uneasy, and at length rode in such miserable spirits that Philip asked him squarely what the trouble was. Was he in love? Upon this Harry made a clean breast of it, and told Philip all he knew about the Selby affair, and Laura's treatment of him, sometimes encouraging him, and then throwing him off, and finally his belief that she would go to the bad, if something was not done to arouse her from her infatuation. He wished Philip was in Washington. He knew Laura, and she had a great respect for his character, his opinions, his judgment. Perhaps he, as an uninterested person, whom she would have some confidence, and as one of the public, could say something to her that would show her where she stood. Philip saw the situation clearly enough. Of Laura he knew not much, except that she was a woman of uncommon fascination, and he thought from what he had seen of her in Hawkeye, her conduct towards him and towards Harry, of not too much principle. Of course he knew nothing of her history, he knew nothing seriously against her, and if Harry was desperately enamored of her, why should he not win her, if he could? If, however, she had already become what Harry uneasily felt she might become, was it not his duty to go to the rescue of his friend, and try to save him from any rash act, on account of a woman that might prove to be entirely unworthy of him? For trifler and visionary as he was, Harry deserved a better fate than this. Philip determined to go to Washington and see for himself. He had other reasons also. He began to know enough of Mr. Bolton's affairs to be uneasy. Pennybacker had been there several times during the winter, and he suspected that he was involving Mr. Bolton in some doubtful scheme. Pennybacker was in Washington, and Philip thought he might perhaps find out something about him and his plans that would be of service to Mr. Bolton. Philip had enjoyed his winter very well for a man with his arm broken and his head smashed. With two such nurses as Ruth and Alice, illness seemed to him rather a nice holiday, and every moment of his convalescence had been precious and all too fleeting. With a young fellow of the habits of Philip, such injuries cannot be counted on to tarry long, even for the purpose of love-making and Philip found himself getting strong with even disagreeable rapidity. During his first weeks of pain and weakness, Ruth was unceasing in her ministrations. She quietly took charge of him, and with a gentle firmness resisted all attempts of Alice or anyone else 
to share to any great extent the burden with her. She was clear, decisive, and peremptory in whatever she did. But often when Philip opened his eyes in those first days of suffering, and found her standing by his bedside, he saw a look of tenderness in her anxious face that quickened his already feverish pulse, a look that remained in his heart long after he closed his eyes. Sometimes he felt her hand on his forehead, and did not open his eyes for fear she would take it away. He watched for her coming to his chamber. He could distinguish her light footstep from all others. If this is what is meant by women practicing medicine, thought Philip to himself, I like it. Ruth, said he one day, when he was getting to be quite himself, I believe in it. Believe in what? Why, in women physicians. Then I'd better call in Mrs. Dr. Longstreet. Oh, no, one will do, one at a time. I think I should be well tomorrow if I thought I should never have any other. Thy physician thinks thee mustn't talk, Philip, said Ruth, putting her finger on his lips. "'But, Ruth, I want to tell you that I should wish I never had got well if—' "'There, there, thee must not talk. Thee is wandering again.' And Ruth closed his lips with a smile on her own that broadened into a merry laugh as she ran away. Philip was not weary, however, of making these attempts. He rather enjoyed it. But whenever he inclined to be sentimental, Ruth would cut him off with some such gravely conceived speech as— does thee think that thy physician will take advantage of the condition of a man who is as weak as thee is? I will call Alice if thee has any dying confessions to make. As Philip convalesced, Alice more and more took Ruth's place as his entertainer, and read to him by the hour, when he did not want to talk, to talk about Ruth, as he did a good deal of the time. Nor was this altogether unsatisfactory to Philip. He was always happy and contented with Alice. She was the most restful person he knew, better informed than Ruth, and with a much more varied culture, and bright and sympathetic. He was never weary of her company, if he was not greatly excited by it. She had upon his mind that peaceful influence that Mrs. Bolton had, when occasionally she sat by his bedside with her work. Some people have this influence, which is like an emanation. They bring peace to a house. They diffuse serene content in a room full of mixed company, though they may say very little, and are apparently unconscious of their own power. Not that Philip did not long for Ruth's presence all the same. Since he was well enough to be about the house, she was busy again with her studies. Now and then her teasing humor came again. She always had a playful shield against his sentiment. Philip used sometimes to declare that she had no sentiment, and then he doubted if he should be pleased with her after all, if she were at all sentimental, and he rejoiced that she had, in such matters, what he called the airy grace of sanity. She was the most gay, serious person he ever saw. Perhaps he was not so much at rest or so contented with her as with Alice, but then he loved her and what have rest and contentment to do with love. End of chapter 41。Chapter 42 of The Gilded Age。This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Piper Hayes. THE GILDED AGE by Mark Twain and Charles Dudley Warner CHAPTER 42 Mr. Buckstone's campaign was brief, much briefer than he supposed it would be. He began it purposing to win Laura without being won himself, but his experience was that of all who had fought on that field before him. He diligently continued his effort to win her but he presently found that while as yet he could not feel entirely certain of having won her it was very manifest that she had won him he had made an able fight brief as it was and that at least was to his credit he was in good company now he walked in a leash of conspicuous captives 
these unfortunates followed laura helplessly for whenever she took a prisoner he remained her slave henceforth sometimes they chafed in their bondage sometimes they tore themselves free and said their serfdom was ended but sooner or later they always came back penitent and worshipping laura pursued her usual course she encouraged mr buckstone by turns and by turns she harassed him she exalted him to the clouds at one time and at another she dragged him down again she constituted him chief champion of the knobs university bill and he accepted the position at first reluctantly but later as a valued means of serving her he even came to look upon it as a piece of great good fortune since it brought him into such frequent contact with her through him she learned that the honourable mr trollope was a bitter enemy of her bill he urged her not to attempt to influence mr trollope in any way and explained that whatever she might attempt in that direction would surely be used against her and with damaging effect she at first said she knew mr trollope and was aware that he had a blank blank her private figure of speech for brother or son-in-law but mr buckstone said that he was not able to conceive what so curious a phrase as blank blank might mean and had no wish to pry into the matter since it was probably private he would nevertheless venture the blind assertion that nothing would answer in this particular case and during this particular session but to be exceedingly wary and keep clear away from mr trollope any other course would be fatal it seemed that nothing could be done laura was seriously troubled everything was looking well and yet it was plain that one vigorous and determined enemy might eventually succeed in overthrowing all her plans a suggestion came into her mind presently and she said can't you fight against his great pension bill and bring him to terms oh never he and i are sworn brothers on that measure we work in harness and are very loving i do everything i possibly can for him there but i work with might and main against his immigration bill as pertinaciously and as vindictively indeed as he works against our university we hate each other through half a conversation and are all affection through the other half we understand each other he is an admirable worker outside the capital he will do more for the pension bill than any other man could do i wish he would make the great speech on it which he wants to make and then i would make another and we would be safe well if he wants to make a great speech why doesn't he do it visitors interrupted the conversation and mr buckstone took his leave it was not of the least moment to laura that her question had not been answered inasmuch as it concerned a thing which did not interest her and yet human being like she thought she would have liked to know an opportunity occurring presently she put the same question to another person and got an answer that satisfied her she pondered a good while that night after she had gone to bed and when she finally turned over to go to sleep she had thought out a new scheme the next evening at mrs cleverson's party she said to mr buckstone i want mr trollope to make his great speech on the pension bill do you but you remember i was interrupted and did not explain to you never mind i know you must make him make that speech i very particularly desire it oh it is easy to say make him do it but how am i to make him it is perfectly easy i have thought it all out she then went into the details at length mr buckstone said i see now i can manage it i am sure indeed i wonder he never thought of it himself there are no end of precedents but how is this going to benefit you after i have managed it there is where the mystery lies but i will take care of that it will benefit me a great deal i only wish i could see how it is the oddest freak you seem to go the furthest around to get at a thing but you are in earnest aren't you yes i am indeed very well i will do it but why not tell me how you imagine it is going to help you i will by and by now there is nobody talking to him go straight and do it there's a good fellow a moment or two later the two sworn friends of the pension bill were talking together earnestly and seemingly unconscious of the moving throng about them they talked an hour and then mr buckstone came back and said he hardly fancied it at first but he fell in love with it after a bit 
and we have made a compact, too. I am to keep his secret, and he is to spare me in future, when he gets ready to denounce the supporters of the university bill, and I can easily believe he will keep his word on this occasion. A fortnight elapsed, and the university bill had gathered to itself many friends meantime. Senator Dilworthy began to think the harvest was ripe. He conferred with Laura privately. She was able to tell him exactly how the House would vote. There was a majority. The bill would pass, unless weak members got frightened at the last and deserted, a thing pretty likely to occur. The senator said, "'I wish we had one more good strong man. Now Trollope ought to be on our side, for he is a friend of the Negro. But he is against us, and is our bitterest opponent. If he would simply vote no, but keep quiet and not molest us, I would feel perfectly cheerful and content. But perhaps there is no use in thinking of that. Why, I laid a little plan for his benefit two weeks ago. I think he will be tractable, maybe. He is to come here to-night. Look out for him, my child. He means mischief, sure. It is said that he claims to know of improper practices having been used in the interest of this bill, and he thinks he sees a chance to make a great sensation when the bill comes up. Be wary. Be very, very careful, my dear. Do your very ablest talking now. You can convince a man of anything when you try. You must convince him that if anything improper has been done, you, at least, are ignorant of it and sorry for it. And if you could only persuade him out of his hostility to the bill, too. But don't overdo the thing. Don't seem too anxious, dear. I won't. I'll be ever so careful. I'll talk as sweetly to him as if he were my own child. You may trust me, indeed you may. The doorbell rang. That is the gentleman now, said Laura. Senator Dilworthy retired to his study. Laura welcomed Mr. Trollope, a grave, carefully dressed, and very respectable-looking man, with a bald head, standing collar, and old-fashioned watch-seals. Promptness is a virtue, Mr. Trollope, and I perceive that you have it. You are always prompt with me. I always meet my engagements of every kind, Miss Hawkins. It is a quality which is rarer in the world than it has been, I believe. I wish to see you on business, Mr. Trollope. I judge so. What can I do for you? You know my bill, the Knobs University bill. Ah! I believe it is your bill. I had forgotten. Yes, I know the bill. Well, would you mind telling me your opinion of it? Indeed, since you seem to ask it without reserve, I am obliged to say that I do not regard it favorably. I have not seen the bill itself, but from what I can hear, it, it, well, it has a bad look about it. It, speak it out, never fear. Well, it, they say it contemplates a fraud upon the government. Well, said Laura tranquilly. Well, I say well, too. Well, suppose it were a fraud, which I feel able to deny. Would it be the first one? You take a body's breath away. Would you, did you wish me to vote for it? Was that what you wanted to see me about? Your instinct is correct. I did want you, I do want you to vote for it. Vote for a fr for a measure which is generally believed to be at least questionable? I am afraid we cannot come to an understanding, Miss Hawkins. No, I am afraid not. If you have resumed your principles, Mr. Trollope. Did you send for me merely to insult me? It is time for me to take my leave, Miss Hawkins. No, wait a moment. Don't be offended at a trifle. Do not be offish and unsociable. The steamship subsidy bill was a fraud on the government. You voted for it, Mr. Trollope, though you always opposed the measure, until after you had an interview one evening with a certain Mrs. McCarter at her house. She was my agent. She was acting for me. Ah, that is right. Sit down again. You can be sociable easily enough if you have a mind to. Well, I am waiting. Have you nothing to say? 
"'Miss Hawkins, I voted for that bill because when I came to examine into it, "'Ah, yes, when you came to examine into it. "'Well, I only want you to examine into my bill. "'Mr. Trollope, you would not sell your vote on that subsidy bill, "'which was perfectly right, but you accepted of some of the stock, "'with the understanding that it was to stand in your brother-in-law's name. "'There is no pr I mean, this is utterly groundless, Miss Hawkins. But the gentleman seems somewhat uneasy, nevertheless. Well, not entirely so, perhaps. I and a person whom we will call Miss Blank, never mind the real name, were in a closet at your elbow all the while. Mr. Trollope winced. Then he said with dignity, Miss Hawkins, is it possible that you were capable of such a thing as that? It was bad, I confess that. It was bad, almost as bad as selling one's vote for. But I forget. You did not sell your vote. You only accepted a little trifle, a small token of esteem for your brother-in-law. Oh, let us come out and be frank with each other. I know you, Mr. Trollope. I have met you on business three or four times. True. I never offered to corrupt your principles, never hinted such a thing. But always, when I had finished sounding you, I manipulated you through an agent. Let us be frank. Wear this comely disguise of virtue before the public. It will count there. But here it is out of place. My dear sir, by and by there is going to be an investigation into that national internal improvement director's relief measure of a few years ago and you know very well that you will be a crippled man as likely as not when it is completed it cannot be shown that a man is a knave merely for owning that stock i am not distressed about the national improvement relief measure oh indeed i am not trying to distress you i only wish to make good my assertion that i knew you Several of you gentlemen bought of that stock, without paying a penny down, received dividends from it. Think of the happy idea of receiving dividends, and very large ones, too, from stock one hasn't paid for, and all the while your names never appeared in the transaction. If ever you took the stock at all, you took it in other people's names. Now you see, you had to know one of two things. Namely, you either knew that the idea of all this preposterous generosity was to bribe you into future legislative friendship, or you didn't know it. That is to say, you had to be either a knave or a, well, a fool. There was no middle ground. You are not a fool, Mr. Trollope. Miss Hawking, you flatter me. But seriously... You do not forget that some of the best and purest men in Congress took that stock in that way? Did Senator Bland? Well, no, I believe not. Of course you believe not. Do you suppose he was ever approached on the subject? Perhaps not. If you had approached him, for instance, fortified with the fact that some of the best men in Congress, and the purest, etc., etc., what would have been the result? Well, what would have been the result? He would have shown you the door. For Mr. Blank is neither a knave nor a fool. There are other men in the Senate and the House whom no one would have been hardy enough to approach with that relief stock in that peculiarly generous way. But they are not of the class that you regard as the best and purest. No, I say I know you, Mr. Trollope. That is to say... One may suggest a thing to Mr. Trollope, which it would not do to suggest to Mr. Blank. Mr. Trollope, you are pledged to support the indigent congressman's retroactive appropriation, which is to come up either in this or the next session. You do not deny that, even in public. The man that will vote for that bill will break the Eighth Commandment in any other way, sir. But he will not vote for your corrupt measure, nevertheless, madam exclaimed mr trollope rising from his seat in a passion ah but he will sit down again and let me explain why 
oh come don't behave so it is very unpleasant now be good and you shall have the missing page of your great speech here it is and she displayed a sheet of manuscript mr trollope turned immediately back from the threshold it might have been gladness that flashed him to his face it might have been something else but at any rate there was much astonishment mixed with it good where did you get it give it me now there is no hurry sit down sit down and let us talk and be friendly the gentleman wavered then he said no this is only a subterfuge i will go it is not the missing page laura tore off a couple of lines from the bottom of the sheet now she said you will know whether this is the handwriting or not you know it is the handwriting now if you will listen you will know that this must be the list of statistics which was to be the nub of your great effort and the accompanying blast the beginning of the burst of eloquence which was continued on the next page and you will recognize that there was where you broke down she read the page mr trollope said this is perfectly astounding still what is all this to me it is nothing it does not concern me the speech is made and there an end i did break down for a moment and in a rather uncomfortable place since i had led up to those statistics with some grandeur the hiatus was pleasanter to the house and the galleries than it was to me but it is no matter now a week has passed the jests about it ceased three or four days ago the whole thing is a matter of indifference to me miss hawkins but you apologized and promised the statistics for next day why didn't you keep your promise the matter was not of sufficient consequence the time has gone by to produce an effect with them but i hear that other friends of the soldiers pension bill desire them very much i think you ought to let them have them miss hawkins this silly blunder of my copyist evidently has more interest for you than it has for me i will send my private secretary to you and let him discuss the subject with you at length did he copy your speech for you of course he did why all these questions tell me how did you get hold of that page of manuscript that is the only thing that stirs a passing interest in my mind i'm coming to that then she said much as if she were talking to herself it does seem like taking a deal of unnecessary pains for a body to hire another body to construct a great speech for him and then go and get still another body to copy it before it can be read in the house miss hawkins what do you mean by such talk as that why i am sure i mean no harm no harm to anybody in the world i am certain that i overheard the honourable mr buckstone either promise to write your great speech for you or else get some other competent person to do it this is perfectly absurd madam perfectly absurd and mr trollope affected a laugh of derision why the thing has occurred before now i mean that i have heard that congressmen have sometimes hired literary grubs to build speeches for them now didn't i overhear a conversation like that i spoke of pshaw why of course you may have overheard some such jesting nonsense but would one be in earnest about so farcical a thing well if it was only a joke why did you make a serious matter of it why did you get the speech written for you and then read it in the house without ever having it copied mr trollope did not laugh this time he seemed seriously perplexed he said come play out your jest miss hawkins i can't understand what you are contriving but it seems to entertain you so please go on i will i assure you but i hope to make the matter entertaining to you too your private secretary never copied your speech indeed really you seem to know my affairs better than i do myself i believe i do you can't name your own amanuensis mr trollope that is sad indeed perhaps miss hawkins can yes i can i wrote your speech myself and you read it from my manuscript there now mr trollope did not spring to his feet and smite his brow with his hand while a cold sweat broke out all over him and the color forsook his face no he only said 
"'Good God!' and looked greatly astonished. Laura handed him her commonplace book, and called his attention to the fact that the handwriting there and the handwriting of this speech were the same. He was shortly convinced. He laid the book aside and said composedly, "'Well, the wonderful tragedy is done, and it transpires that I am indebted to you for my late eloquence. What of it? What was all this for, and what does it amount to, after all? What do you propose to do about it?' "'Oh, nothing. It is only a bit of pleasantry. When I overheard that conversation, I took an early opportunity to ask Mr. Buckstone if he knew of anybody who might want a speech written.' I had a friend, and so forth, and so on. I was the friend myself. I thought I might do you a good turn, then, and depend on you to do me one by and by. I never let Mr. Buckstone have the speech till the last moment, and when you hurried off to the house with it, you did not know there was a missing page, of course. But I did. And now perhaps you think that if I refuse to support your bill, you will make a grand exposure? Well, I had not thought of that. I only kept back the page for the mere fun of the thing. But since you mention it, I don't know, but I might do something if I were angry. My dear Miss Hawkins, if you were to give out that you composed my speech, you know very well that people would say it was only your raillery, your fondness for putting a victim in the pillory and amusing the public at his expense. It is too flimsy, Miss Hawkins, for a person of your fine inventive talent. Contrive an abler device than that. Come. It is easily done, Mr. Trollope. I will hire a man and pin this page on his breast and label it The Missing Fragment of the Honorable Mr. Trollope's Great Speech, which speech was written and composed by Miss Laura Hawkins, under a secret understanding, for one hundred dollars, and the money has not been paid. And I will pin round about it notes in my handwriting, which I will procure from prominent friends of mine for the occasion, also your printed speech in the globe showing the connection between its bracketed hiatus and my fragment. And I give you my word of honor that I will stand that human bulletin board in the rotunda of the Capitol and make him stay there a week. You see you are premature, Mr. Trollope. The wonderful tragedy is not done yet by any means. Come now, doesn't it improve? Mr. Trollope opened his eyes rather widely at this novel aspect of the case. He got up and walked the floor and gave himself a moment for reflection. Then he stopped and studied Laura's face a while, and ended by saying, "'Well, I am obliged to believe you would be reckless enough to do that.' "'Then don't put me to the test, Mr. Trollope. But let's drop the matter. I have had my joke, and you've borne the infliction becomingly enough. It spoils a jest to harp on it after one has had one's laugh.' I would much rather talk about my bill. So would I now, my clandestine amanuensis. Compared with some other subjects, even your bill is a pleasant topic to discuss. Very good indeed. I thought I could persuade you. Now I am sure you will be generous to the poor negro and vote for that bill. Yes, I feel more tenderly toward the oppressed colored man than I did. Shall we bury the hatchet and be good friends, and respect each other's little secrets, on condition that I vote I on the measure? With all my heart, Mr. Trollope, I give you my word of that. It is a bargain, but isn't there something else you could give me, too? Laura looked at him inquiringly a moment, and then she comprehended. Oh, yes, you may have it now. I haven't any more use for it. She picked up the page of manuscript, but she reconsidered her intention of handing it to him, and said, "'But never mind. I will keep it close. No one shall see it. You shall have it as soon as your vote is recorded.' Mr. Trollope looked disappointed, but presently made his adieu, and had got as far as the hall when something occurred to Laura. She said to herself, "'I don't simply want his vote under compulsion.' He might vote I, but work against the bill in secret, for revenge. That man is unscrupulous enough to do anything. I must have his hearty cooperation as well as his vote. There is only one way to get that. She called him back and said, I value your vote, Mr. Trollope, but I value your influence more. You are able to help a measure along in many ways, if you choose. 
I want to ask you to work for the bill as well as vote for it. It takes so much of one's time, Miss Hawkins, and time is money, you know. Yes, I know it is, especially in Congress. Now there is no use in you and I dealing in pretenses and going at matters in roundabout ways. We know each other. Disguises are nonsense. Let us be plain. I will make it an object to you to work for the bill. Don't make it unnecessarily plain, please. There are little proprieties that are best preserved. What do you propose? Well, this. She mentioned the names of several prominent congressmen. Now, said she, these gentlemen are to vote and work for the bill, simply out of love for the Negro, and out of pure generosity I have put in a relative of each as a member of the university and corporation. They will handle a million or so of money, officially, but will receive no salaries. A larger number of statesmen are to vote and work for the bill, also out of love for the Negro. Gentlemen of but moderate influence these, and out of pure generosity I am to see that relatives of theirs have positions in the university, with salaries, and good ones too. You will vote and work for the bill, from mere affection for the Negro, and I desire to testify my gratitude becomingly. Make free choice. Have you any friend whom you would like to present with a salaried or unsalaried position in our institution? Well, I have a brother-in-law. That same old brother-in-law, you good unselfish provider. I have heard of him often through my agents. How regularly he does turn up, to be sure. He could deal with those millions virtuously, and with all with ability, too. But of course you would rather he had a salaried position. Oh, no, said the gentleman facetiously. We are very humble, very humble in our desires. We want no money, we labor solely for our country, and require no reward but the luxury of an applauding conscience. Make him one of those poor, hard-working, unsalaried corporators, and let him do everybody good with those millions, and go hungry himself. I will try to exert a little influence in favor of the bill. Arrived at home, Mr. Trollope sat down and thought it all over. Something after this fashion. It is about the shape it might have taken if he had spoken it aloud. My reputation is getting a little damaged, and I meant to clear it up brilliantly with an exposure of this bill at the supreme moment, and ride back into Congress on the eclat of it and if I had that bit of manuscript, I would do it yet. It would be more money in my pocket in the end than my brother-in-law will get out of that incorporatorship, fat as it is. But that sheet of paper is out of my reach. She will never let that get out of her hands. And what a mountain it is! It blocks up my road completely. She was going to hand it to me once. Why didn't she? must be a deep woman. Deep devil. That is what she is, a beautiful devil, and perfectly fearless, too. The idea of her pinning that paper on a man and standing him up in the rotunda looks absurd at first glance. But she would do it. She is capable of doing anything. I went there hoping she would try to bribe me. Good, solid capital that would be in the exposure. Well, my prayer was answered. She did try to bribe me, and I made the best of a bad bargain, and let her. I am checkmated. I must contrive something fresh to get back to Congress on. Very well. A bird in the hand is worth two in the bush. I will work for the bill. The incorporatorship will be a very good thing. As soon as Mr. Trollope had taken his leave, Laura ran to Senator Dilworthy and began to speak, but he interrupted her and said distressfully, without even turning from his writing to look at her, "'Only half an hour. You gave it up early, child. However, it was best, it was best. I'm sure it was best. And safest.' "'Give it up? I?' The Senator sprang up, all aglow. "'My child, you can't mean that you—' 
I've made him promise on honor to think about a compromise tonight, and come and tell me his decision in the morning. Good, there's hope yet that— Nonsense, uncle. I've made him engage to let the Tennessee land bill utterly alone. Impossible, you— I've made him promise to vote with us. Incredible. Absol— I've made him swear that he'll work for us. Preposterous. Utterly pre— Break a window, child, before I suffocate. No matter, it's true anyway. Now we can march into Congress with drums beating and colors flying. Well, well, well. I'm sadly bewildered, sadly bewildered. I can't understand it at all, the most extraordinary woman that ever. It's a great day. It's a great day. There, there, let me put my hand in benediction on this precious head. Ah, oh, my child, the poor negro will bless— Oh, bother the poor negro, uncle. Put it in your speech. Good night, good-bye. We'll marshal our forces and march with the dawn. Laura reflected a while when she was alone, and then fell to laughing peacefully. Everybody works for me, so ran her thought. It was a good idea to make Buckstone lead Mr. Trollope on to get a great speech written for him, and it was a happy part of the same idea for me to copy the speech after Mr. Buckstone had written it, and then keep back a page. Mr. B. was very complimentary to me when Trollope's breakdown in the house showed him the object of my mysterious scheme. I think he will say still finer things when I tell him the triumph the sequel to it has gained for us. But what a coward the man was to believe I would have exposed that page in the rotunda, and so exposed myself. However, I don't know. I don't know. I will think a moment. Suppose he voted no. Suppose the bill failed. That is to suppose this stupendous game lost forever that I have played so desperately for. Suppose people came around pitying me. Odious! And he could have saved me by his single voice. Yes, I would have exposed him. What would I care for the talk that that would have made about me when I was gone to Europe with Selby? and all the world was busy with my history and my dishonor. It would be almost happiness to spite somebody at such a time. End of chapter 42「Chapter 43 of The Gilded Age」This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Kenneth Sargent Gagan. The Gilded Age by Mark Twain and Charles Dudley Warner. Chapter 43 The very next day, sure enough, the campaign opened. In due course, the Speaker of the House reached that order of business which is termed Notices of Bills, and then the Honorable Mr. Buckstone rose in his place and gave notice of a bill to found and incorporate the Knobs Industrial University, and then sat down without saying anything. The busy gentlemen in the reporter's gallery jotted a line in their notebooks, ran to the telegraph desk, in a room which communicated with their own writing parlor, and then hurried back to their places in the gallery. And by the time they had resumed their seats, the line which they had delivered to the operator had been read in telegraph offices in towns and cities hundreds of miles away. It was distinguished by frankness of language as well as by brevity. The child is born. Buckstone gives notice of the thieving Knobs University job. It is said the noses have been counted, and enough votes have been bought to pass it. For some time the correspondents had been posting their several journals upon the alleged disreputable nature of the bill, and furnishing daily reports of the Washington gossip concerning it. So the next morning nearly every newspaper of character in the land assailed the measure and hurled broadsides of invective at Mr. Buckstone. The Washington papers were more respectful, as usual, 
and conciliatory. Also, as usual, they generally supported measures when it was possible. But when they could not, they deprecated violent expressions of opinion in other journalistic quarters. They always deprecated when there was trouble ahead. However, the Washington Daily Love Feast hailed the bill with warm approbation. This was Senator Ballum's paper, or rather, Brother Ballum, as he was popularly called, for he had been a clergyman in his day, and he himself and all that he did still admitted an odor of sanctity now that he diverged into journalism and politics. He was a power in the congressional prayer meeting, and all movements that looked to the spread of religion and temperance. His paper supported the new bill with gushing affection. It was a noble measure. It was a just measure. It was a generous measure. It was a pure measure. And that surely should recommend it to these corrupt times. And finally, if the nature of the bill were not known to all, the love feast would support it anyway. And unhesitatingly, for the fact that Senator Dilworthy was the originator of the measure, was a guarantee that it contemplated a worthy and righteous work. Senator Dilworthy was so anxious to know what the New York papers would say about the bill that he had arranged to have synopsis of their editorials telegraphed to him. He could not wait for the papers themselves to crawl along down to Washington by a mail train, which has never run over a cow since the road was built for the reason that it has never been able to overtake one. It carries the usual cow-catcher in the front of the locomotive, but this is mere ostentatious. It ought to be attached to the rear car, where it could do some good. But instead, no provision is made there for the protection of the traveling public, and hence it is not a matter of surprise that cows so frequently climb aboard that train and among the passengers. The senator read his dispatches aloud at the breakfast table. Laura was troubled beyond measure at their tone, and said that that sort of comment would defeat the bill. But the senator said, Oh, not at all, not at all, my child. It's just what we want. Persecution is the one thing needful now. All the other forces are secure. Give us newspaper persecution enough, and we are safe. Vigorous persecution will alone carry a bill sometimes, dear. And when you start with a strong vote in the first place, persecution comes in with double effect. It scares off some of the weak supporters, true, but soon it turns strong ones into stubborn ones, and then, presently, it changes the tide of public opinion. The great public is weak-minded. The great public is sentimental. The great public always turns around and weeps for an odious murderer, and prays for him, and carries flowers to his prison, and besieges the governor with appeals to his clemency. As soon as the papers begin to howl for that man's blood, in a word, the great putty-hearted public loves to gush, and there's no such darling opportunity to gush as a case of persecution affords. Well, uncle dear, if your theory is right, let us go into raptures, for nobody can ask a heartier persecution than these editorials are furnishing. I'm not sure of that, my daughter. I don't entirely like the tone of some of these remarks. They lack like vim. They lack like venom. Here's one calls it a questionable measure. Bah! There's no strength in that. This one is better. It calls it highway robbery. But now this one seems satisfied to call it an iniquitous scheme. <laughs> iniquitous does not exasperate anybody. It is weak, puerile. The ignorant will imagine it to be intended for a compliment. But this other one, the one I read last, has the true ring. This vile, dirty effort to rob the public treasury by the kites and vultures that now infest the filthy den called Congress. That is admirable. Admirable! We must have more of that sort. But it will come. No fear of that. They're not even warmed up yet. A week from now, you'll see. Uncle, you and your brother Balaam are bosom friends. Why don't you get his paper to persecute us, too? Huh, isn't worthwhile, my daughter. His support doesn't hurt a bill. Nobody reads his editorials but himself. 
but I wish the New York papers would talk a little plainer. It is annoying to have to wait a week for them to warm up. I expect better things at their hands, and time is precious now. At the proper hour, according to his previous notice, Mr. Buckstone duly introduced his bill entitled, An Act to Found and Incorporate the Knobs Industrial University, moved its proper reference, and sat down. The Speaker of the House rattled off this observation. For objectionable bill, referred. Habituates of the House comprehend that this long, lightning-heeled word signified if there was no objection, the bill would take the customary course of a measure of its nature, and be referred to the Committee on Benevolent Appropriations, and that it was accordingly so referred. Strangers merely suppose that the speaker was taking a gargle for some affection of the throat. The reporters immediately telegraphed the introduction of the bill, and they added the assertion that the bill will pass was premature. It is said that many favors of it will desert when the storm breaks upon them from the public press. The storm came, and during ten days it waxed more and more violent day by day. The great Negro University swindle became the one absorbing topic of conversation throughout the nation. Individuals denounced it. Journals denounced it. Public meetings denounced it. The pictorial papers caricatured its friends. The whole nation seemed to be growing frantic over it. Meantime, the Washington correspondents were sending such telegrams as these abroad in the land under date of Saturday. Congressman Jex and Fluke are wavering. It is believed they will desert the execrable bill. Monday, Jex and Fluke have deserted. Thursday. Tubbs and Huffy left the sinking ship last night. Later on, three desertions. The university thieves are getting scared, though they will not own to it. Later, the leaders are growing stubborn. They swear they cannot carry it. But it is now almost certain that they no longer have a majority. After a day or two of reluctant and ambiguous telegrams, public sentiment seems to be changing. A trifle in favor of the bill but only a trifle. And still later, it is whispered that the Honorable Mr. Trollope has gone over to the pirates. It's probably a canard. Mr. Trollope has all long been the bravest and most efficient champion of virtue and the people against the bill, and the report is, without doubt, a shameless invention. Next day, with characteristic treachery, the truckling and pusillanimous reptile crippled speech Trollope has gone over to the enemy. It is contended now that he has been a friend of the bill in secret since the day it was introduced, and he has bankable reasons for being so. But he himself declares that he has gone over because the malignant persecution of the bill by the newspapers caused him to study its provisions with more care than he had previously done and this close examination revealed the fact that the measure won in every way worthy of his support. Pretty thin. It cannot be denied that this desertion had a damaging effect. Jackson Fluke have returned to their iniquitous allegiance, with six or eight other of lesser caliber, and it is reported and believed that Tubbs and Huffy are ready to go back. It is feared that the university swindle is stronger today than it has been ever before. Later midnight, it is said that the committee will report the bill back tomorrow. Both sides are marshalling their forces, and the fight of this bill is evidently going to be the hottest of the session. All Washington is boiling. End of Chapter 43 Recording by Kenneth Sergeant Gagan, Auburn, California. Chapter 44 of the Gilded Age. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit 
LibriVox.org. Recording by Kenneth Sargent Gagan. The Gilded Age by Mark Twain and Charles Dudley Werner. Chapter 44. It's easy enough for another fellow to talk, said Harry, despondingly, after he had put Philip in possession of his view of the case. It's easy enough to say, give her up, if you don't care for her. What am I going to do, give her up? It seemed to Harry that this was a situation requiring some active measures. He couldn't realize that he had fallen hopelessly in love without some rights accruing to him for the possession of the object of his passion. Quiet resignation under relinquishment of anything he wanted was not in his line. And when it appeared to him that a surrender of Laura would be the withdrawal of the one barrier that kept her from ruin, it was unreasonable to expect that he could see how to give her up. Harry had the most buoyant confidence in his own projects. Always he saw everything connected with himself in a large way and in rosy lines. This predominance of the imagination over judgment gave that appearance of exaggeration to his conversation and to his communications with regard to himself, which sometimes conveyed the impression that he was not speaking the truth. His acquaintances had been known to say that they were invariably allowed a half for shrinkage in his statements, and held the other half under advisement for confirmation. Philip, in this case, could not tell from Harry's story exactly how much encouragement Laura had given him, nor what hopes he might justly have of winning her. He had never seen him desponding before. The brag appeared to be all taken out of him, and his airy manner only asserted itself now and then in a comical imitation of its old self. Philip wanted time to look about him before he decided what to do. He was not familiar with Washington, and it was difficult to adjust his feelings and perceptions to its peculiarities. Coming out of the sweet sanity of the Bolton household, this was by contrast the maddest vanity fair one could conceive. It seemed to him a feverish, unhealthy atmosphere, in which lunacy would be easily developed. He fancied that everybody attached to himself an exaggerated importance from the fact of being at the nation's capital, the center of political influence, the fountain of patronage, preferment, jobs, and opportunities. People were introduced to each other as from this or that state, not from cities and towns, and this gave a largeness to their representative feeling. All the women talk politics as naturally and glibly as they talk fashion or literature elsewhere. There was always some exciting topic at the Capitol, or some huge slander was rising up like a mismatic exultation from the Potomac, threatening to settle no one knew exactly where. Every other person was an aspirant for a place, or, if he had one, for a better place, or more pay. Almost every other one had some claim or interest or remedy to urge. Even the women were all advocates for the advancement of some person, and they violently espoused or denounced this or that measure, as it would affect some relative acquaintance or friend. Love, travel, even death waited on the chances of the dies daily thrown in the two houses and the committee rooms there. If the measure went through, love could afford to ripen into marriage, and longing for foreign travel would have fruitation. And it must have been only eternal hope springing in the breast that kept alive numerous old claimants who for years and years had besieged the doors of Congress and had looked as if they needed not so much an appropriation of money as six feet of ground. And those who stood so long waiting for success to bring them death were usually those who had a just claim. Representing states and talking of national and even international affairs, as familiarly as neighbors at home talk of poor crops and the extravagance of their ministers, was likely at first to impose upon Philip as to the importance of the people gathered here. 
There was a little newspaper editor from Phil's native town, the assistant on a Pendletonian weekly, who made his little annual joke about the first egg laid on our table, and who was the menial of every tradesman in the village, and under bonds to him for the frequent puffs except the undertaker, about whose employment he was recklessly facetious. In Washington, he was an important man, correspondent, and clerk of two house committees, a worker in politics, and a competent critic of every woman and every man in Washington. He would be a consul, no doubt, by and by, at some foreign port, of the language of which he was ignorant, though if ignorance of language were a qualification, he might have been a consul at home. His easy familiarity with great men was so beautiful to see, and when Philip learned what a tremendous underground influence this little ignoramus had, huh, he no longer wondered at the queer appointments and the queerer legislation. Philip was not long in discovering that people in Washington did not differ much from other people. They had the same meanness, generosities, and tastes. A Washington boarding house had the odor of a boarding house the world over. Colonel Sellers was as unchanged as anyone Philip saw whom he had known elsewhere. Washington appeared to be the native element of this man. His pretensions were equal to any he encountered there. He saw nothing in the society that equaled that of Hawkeye. He sat down to no table that could not be unfavorably contrast with his own at home. The most airy scheme inflated in the hot air of the capital only reached in magnitude some of his lesser fancies, the by-play of his constructive imagination. "'The country is getting along very well,' he said to Philip. "'But our public men are too timid. What we want is more money. I've told Boutwell so. Talk about basing the currency on gold. <laughs> you might as well base it on pork. Gold is only one product. Base it on everything. You've got to do something for the West.' How am I to move my crops? We must have improvements. Now Grant's got the idea. We want a canal from James River to the Mississippi. Government ought to build it. It was difficult to get the colonel off from these large themes once he was started. But Philip brought the conversation round to Laura and her reputation in the city. No, he said, I haven't noticed much. We've been so busy about this university. It will make Laura rich with the rest of us, and she has done nearly as much as if she were a man. She has a great talent, and will make a big match. I see the foreign ministers, and that sort after her. Yes, there is talk, always will be, about a pretty woman, so much in public as she is. Tough stories come to me, but I put them away. Tain't likely one of Cy Hawkins' children would do that. Well, she is the same as a child of his. I told her, though, to go slow, added the colonel, as if that mysterious admonition from him would set everything right. Do you know anything about Colonel Selby? asked Philip. <laughs> know all about him. Fine fellow, but he's got a wife, and I told him, as a friend, he'd better sheer off from Laura. I reckon he thought better of it, and he did. But Philip was not long in learning the truth. Quartered as Laura was by a certain class, and still admitted into society that, nevertheless, buzzed with disreputable stories about her, she had lost character with the best people. Her intimacy with Selby was open gossip, and there were winks and thrustings of the tongue in any group of men when she passed by. It was clear enough that Harry's delusions must be broken up, and that no such feeble obstacle as his passion could interpose would turn Laura from her fate. Philip was determined to see her, and put himself in possession of the truth, as he suspected it, in order to show Harry his folly. Laura, after her last conversation with Harry, had a new sense of her position. She had noticed before the signs of a change in manners toward her, a little less respect, perhaps, from men, and in an avoidance by women. She had attributed this latter partly to jealousy of her, 
for no one is willing to acknowledge a fault in themselves when a more agreeable motive can be found for the estrangements of their acquaintances. But now, if society had turned on her, she would defy it. It was not in her nature to shrink. She knew she had been wronged, and she knew that she had no remedy. What she heard of Colonel Selby's proposed departure alarmed her more than anything else, and she calmly determined that if he was deceiving her, the second time it should be the last. Let society finish the tragedy if it liked. She was indifferent what came after. At the first opportunity, she charged Selby with his intentions to abandon her. He blushingly denied it. He had no thoughts of going to Europe. He had only been amusing himself with Seller's schemes. He swore that as soon as she succeeded with her bill, he would fly with her to any part of the world. She did not quite believe him, for she saw that he feared her, and she began to suspect that his were the protestations of a coward to gain time. But she showed him no doubts. She only watched his movement day by day, and always held herself ready to act promptly. When Philip came into the presence of this attractive woman, he could not realize that she was the subject of all the scandal he had heard. She received him with quite the old hawk-eye openness and cordiality, and fell to talking at once of their little acquaintances there. And it seemed impossible that he could ever say to her what he had come determined to say. Such a man as Philip has only one standard by which to judge women. Laura recognized that fact, no doubt. The better part of her woman's nature saw it. Such a man might, years ago, not now, have changed her nature and made the issue of her life so different. Even after her cruel abandonment, she had a dim feeling of this, and she would like now to stand well with him. The spark of truth and honor that was left in her was elicited by his presence. It was this influence that governed her conduct in this interview. "'I have come,' said Philip, in his direct manner, "'from my friend Mr. Brierly. "'You are not ignorant of his feelings toward you.' "'Perhaps not,' said Laura. "'But perhaps you do not know, "'you who have so much admiration, "'how sincere and overmastering his love is for you.' Philip would not have spoken so plainly if he had in mind anything except to draw from Laura something that would end Harry's passion. "'And did sincere love so rare, Mr. Sterling?' asked Laura, moving her foot a little and speaking with a shade of sarcasm. "'Perhaps not in Washington,' replied Philip, tempted into a similar tone. "'Excuse my bluntness,' he continued. "'But with the knowledge of his love... Would his devotion make any difference to you in your Washington life? In respect to what? asked Laura quickly. Well, to others, I won't equivocate. To Colonel Selby. Laura's face flushed with anger or shame, and she looked steadily at Philip and began, By what right, sir? By the right of friendship, interrupted Philip stoutly. It may matter little to you. It's everything to him. He has a quixotic notion that you would turn back from what is before you for his sake. You can't be ignorant of what all the city is talking of. Philip said this determinedly, and with some bitterness. It was a full minute before Laura spoke. Both had arisen, Philip as if to go, and Laura in suppressed excitement. When she spoke, her voice was very unsteady, and, and she looked down. Yes, I know. I perfectly understand what you mean. Mr. Briley is nothing, simply nothing. He's a moth, singed, that's all. A trifler with women, though he thought he was a wasp. I have no pity for him, not the least. You may tell him not to make a fool of himself and to keep away. I say this on your account, not his. You, sir, are not like him. Enough for me that you want it so, Mr. Sterling. She continued, looking up, and there were tears in her eyes that contradicted the hardness of her language. You might not pity him if you knew my history. Perhaps you would not wonder at some things you've heard. No, it's, it's useless to ask me why it must be so. I can't make a life over. Society won't let you if you would. 
and mine must be lived as it is. There, sir, I'm not offended, but it is useless for me to say anything more. Philip went away with his heart enlightened about Harry, but profoundly saddened by the glimpse of what this woman might have been. He told Harry all that was necessary of the conversation. She was bent on going her own way. He had not the ghost of a chance. He was a fool. She had said for thinking he had. And Harry accepted it meekly, and made up his mind that Philip didn't know much about women. End of chapter 44 Recording by Kenneth Sargent Gagan, Auburn, California Chapter 45 of The Gilded Age This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Tom Lennon The Gilded Age by Mark Twain and Charles Dudley Warner Chapter 45 the galleries of the house were packed on the momentous day, not because the reporting of an important bill backed by a committee was a thing to be excited about. If the bill were going to take the ordinary course afterward, it would be like getting excited over the impaneling of a coroner's jury in a murder case, instead of saving up one's emotions for the grander occasion of the hanging of the accused. Two years later, after all the tedious forms the law had been gone through with, but suppose you understood that this coroner's jury is going to turn out to be a vigilance committee in disguise, who will hear testimony for an hour, and then hang the murderer on the spot. That puts a different aspect upon the matter. Now it was whispered that the legitimate forms of procedure usual in the house, and which keep a bill hanging around for days and even weeks before it's finally passed on, we're going to be overruled in this case, and short work made of the measure, and so what was beginning as a mere inquest might turn out to be something very different. In the course of the day's business, the order of reports of committees was finally reached, and when the weary crowds heard that glad announcement issue from the speaker's lips, they ceased to fret at the dragon delay and plucked up spirit. The chairman of the Committee on Benevolent Appropriations rose and made his report, and just then a blue uniform, brass-mounted little page put a note in his hand. It was from Senator Dilworthy, who had appeared on the floor of the House for a moment and flitted away again. Everybody expects a grand assault in force. No doubt you believe, as I certainly do, that it is the thing to do. We are strong, and everything is hot for the contest. Trollope's espousal of our cause has immensely helped us, and we grow in power constantly. Ten of the opposition were called away from town about noon, but, so it is said, only for one day. Six others are sick, but expect to be about again tomorrow or next day, a friend tells me. A bold onslaught is worth trying. Go for a suspension of the rules. You will find we can swing a two-thirds vote. I am perfectly satisfied of it. The Lord's truth will prevail. Dilworthy. Mr. Buckstone had reported the bills from his committee, one by one, leaving the bill to the last. When the House had voted upon the acceptance or rejection of the report upon all but it, and the question now being upon its disposal, Mr. Buckstone begged that the House would give its attention to a few remarks which he desired to make. His committee had instructed him to report the bill favorably. He wished to explain the nature of the measure, and thus justify the committee's action. The hostility roused by the press would then disappear, and the bill would shine forth in its true and noble character. He said that its provisions were simple. It incorporated the Knobs Industrial University, locating it in East Tennessee, declaring it open to all persons without distinction of sex, color, or religion, and committing its management to a board of perpetual trustees with power to fill vacancies in their own number. 
it provided for the erection of certain buildings for the university, dormitories, lecture halls, museums, libraries, laboratories, workshops, furnaces, and mills. It provided also for the purchase of 65,000 acres of land, fully described for the purposes of the university in the knobs of East Tennessee, and it appropriated blank dollars for the purchase of the land, which should be the property of the National Trustees in trust for the uses named. Every effort had been made to secure the refusal of the whole amount of the property of the Hawkins heirs in the knobs, some 75,000 acres, Mr. Buckstone said. But Mr. Washington Hawkins, one of the heirs, objected. He was, indeed, very reluctant to sell any part of the land at any price, and, indeed, this reluctance was justifiable when one considers how constantly and how greatly the property is rising in value. What the South needed, continued Mr. Buckstone, was skilled labor. Without that, it would be unable to develop its mines, build its roads, work to advantage and without great waste its fruitful land, establish manufacturers, or enter upon a prosperous industrial career. Its laborers were almost altogether unskilled. Change them into intelligent, trained workmen, and you increased at once the capital the resources of the entire South, which would enter upon a prosperity hitherto unknown. In five years, the increase in local wealth would not only reimburse the government for the outlay of this appropriation, but pour untold wealth into the Treasury. This was the material view, and the least important in the Honorable Gentleman's opinion. Here he referred to some notes furnished him by Senator Dilworthy, and then continued. God had given us the care of these colored millions. What account should we render to him of our stewardship? We had made them free. Should we leave them ignorant? We had cast them upon their own resources. Should we leave them without tools? We could not tell what the intentions of Providence are in regard to these peculiar people, but our duty was plain. The Knobs Industrial University would be a vast school of modern science and practice, worthy of a great nation. It would combine the advantages of Zurich, Freiburg, Curzo, and Sheffield Scientific. Providence had apparently reserved and set apart the Knobs of East Tennessee for this purpose. What else were they for? Was it not wonderful that for more than thirty years, over a generation, the choicest portion of them had remained in one family, untouched, as if separated for some great use. It might be asked why the government should buy this land, when it had millions of acres, more than the railroad companies desired, which it might devote to this purpose. He answered that the government had no such track of land as this, it had nothing comparable to it for the purposes of the university. This was to be a school of mining, of engineering, of working of metals, of chemistry, zoology, botany, manufactures, agriculture, in short, all the complicated industries that make a state great. There was no place for the location of such a school like the knobs of East Tennessee. The hills abounded in metals of all sorts iron in all its combinations, copper, bismuth, gold and silver in small quantities, platinum, he believed, tin, aluminum. It was covered with forests and strange plants. In the woods were found the coon, the possum, the fox, the deer, and many other animals who roamed in the domain of natural history. Coal existed in enormous quantity and no doubt oil. It was a place for the practice of agricultural experiments that any student who had been successful there would have an easy task in any other portion of the country. No place offered equal facilities for experiments in mining, metallurgy, engineering. He expected to live to see the day when the youth of the South would resort to its mines, its workshops, its laboratories, its furnaces and factories, 
for practical instruction in all the great industrial pursuits. A noisy and rather ill-natured debate followed on, now, and lasted hour after hour. The friends of the bill were instructed by the leaders to make no effort to check it. It was deemed better strategy to tire out the opposition. It was decided to vote down every proposition to adjourn, and so continue the sitting into the night. Opponents might desert then, one by one, and weaken their party, for they had no personal stake in the bill. Sunset came, and still the fight went on. The gas was lit, the crowd in the galleries began to thin, but the contest continued. The crowd returned, by and by, with hunger and thirst appeased, and aggravated the hungry and thirsty house by looking contented and comfortable. But still the wrangle lost nothing in its bitterness. Recesses were moved plaintively by the opposition, and invariably voted down by the university army. At midnight the house presented a spectacle calculated to interest a stranger. The great galleries were still thronged, though only with men now. The bright colors that had made them look like hanging gardens were gone with the ladies. The reporter's gallery was merely occupied by one or two watchful sentinels of the Quill Driving Guild. The main body cared nothing for a debate that had dwindled to a mere vaporizing of dull speakers and now and then a brief quarrel over a point of order, but there was an unusually large attendance of journalists in the reporter's waiting room, chatting, smoking, and keeping on the key V for the general interruption of the congressional volcano that must come when the time was right for it. Senator Dillsworthy and Philip were in the diplomatic gallery. Washington sat in the public gallery, and Colonel Sellers was not far away. The Colonel had been flying about the Carters and buttonholing congressmen all the evening, and believed that he had accomplished a world of valuable service, but fatigue was telling upon him now, and he was quiet and speechless for once. Below, a few senators lounged upon the sofas set apart for visitors and talked with idle congressmen. A dreary member was speaking, the presiding officer was nodding, and here and there little knots of members stood in the aisles, whispering together. All about the house others sat in the various attitudes that expressed weariness. Some tilted back, had one or more legs disposed upon their desks, some sharpened pencils indolently, some scribbled aimlessly, some yawned and stretched. A great many lay upon their breasts upon the desks, sound asleep and gently snoring. The flooding gaslight from the fancifully wrought roof poured down upon the tranquil scene. Hardly a sound disturbed the stillness save the monotonous eloquence of the gentlemen who occupied the floor. Now and then a warrior from the opposition broke down under the pressure, gave it up, and went home. Mr. Buckstone began to think it might be safe now to proceed to business. He consulted with Trollope and one or two others. Senator Dilworthy descended to the floor of the house, and they went to meet him. After a brief comparison of notes, the congressmen sought their seats and sent pages about the house with messages to friends. These latter instantly roused up, yawned, and began to look alert. The moment the floor was unoccupied, Mr. Buckstone rose with an injured look and said it was evident that the opponents of the bill were merely talking against time, hoping in this unbecoming way to tire out the friends of the measure and so defeat it. Such conduct might be respectable enough in a village debating society, but it was trivial among statesmen. It was out of place in so august an assemblage as the House of Representatives of the United States. The friends of the bill had been not only willing that its opponents should express their opinions, but had strongly desired it. They courted the fullest and freest discussion, but it seemed to him that this fairness was but illy appreciated since gentlemen were capable of taking advantage of it for selfish and unworthy ends. This trifling had gone far enough. He called for the question. 
The instant Mr. Buckstone sat down, the storm burst forth. A dozen gentlemen sprang to their feet. Mr. Speaker! Mr. Speaker! Mr. Speaker! Order, 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 question, question! The sharp blows of the Speaker's gavel rose above the din. The previous question, the hated gag, was moved and carried. All debate came to a sudden end, of course. Triumph number one. Then the vote was taken on the adoption of the report, and it carried by a surprising majority. Mr. Buckstone got the floor again and moved that the rules be suspended and the bill read a first time. Second the motion. It's moved and a clamoring of voices. We move to adjourn. Second the motion. Adjourn. Adjourn. Order. Order. It is moved and seconded that the House do now adjourn. All those in favor? Division. Division. Eyes and knees. Eyes and knees. It was decided to vote upon the adjournment by eyes and knees. This was in earnest. The excitement was furious. The galleries were in commotion in an instant. The reporters swarmed to their places. Idling members of the house flocked to their seats. Nervous gentlemen sprang to their feet. Pages flew hither and thither. Life and animation were visible everywhere. All the long ranks of faces in the building were kindled. This thing decides it, thought Mr. Buckstone, but let the fight proceed. The voting began, and every sound ceased but the calling of the names and the I, no, no, I of the responses. There was not a movement in the house. The people seemed to hold their breath. The voting ceased, and then there was an interval of dead silence while the clerk made up his count. There was a two-thirds vote on the university side, and two over. The rules are suspended. The motion is carried. First reading of the bill. By one impulse, the galleries broke forth into stormy applause, and even some of the members of the House were not wholly able to restrain their feelings. The speaker's gavel came to the rescue, and his clear voice followed. Order, gentlemen. The House will come to order. If spectators offend again, the sergeant-at-arms will clear the galleries. Then he cast his eyes aloft and gazed at some object attentively for a moment. All eyes followed the direction of the speakers, and then there was a general titter. And the speaker said, let the sergeant-at-arms inform the gentleman that his conduct is an infringement on the dignity of the house, and one which is not warranted by the state of the weather. Poor Sellers was the culprit. He sat in the front seat of the gallery with his arms and his tired body overflowing the balustrade, sound asleep, dead to all excitements, all disturbances. The fluctuations of the Washington weather had influenced his dreams, perhaps, for during the recent tempest of applause, he had hoisted his gingham umbrella and calmly gone on with his slumbers. Washington Hawkins had seen the act, but was not near enough at hand to save his friend, and no one who was near enough desired to spoil the effect. But a neighbor stirred up the colonel, now that the house had its eyes upon him, and the great speculator furled his tent like the Arab, and he said, Bless my soul, I'm so absent-minded when I get to thinking. I never wear an umbrella in the house. Did anybody notice it? What? Asleep? Indeed. Did you wake me, sir? Thank you, thank you very much indeed. It might have fallen out of my hands and been injured. Admirable article, sir, presented from a friend in Hong Kong. One doesn't come across silk like that in this country. It's the real. Young Hydeson, I'm told. By this time the incident was forgotten, for the house was at war again. Victory was almost in sight now, and the friends of the bill threw themselves into their work with enthusiasm. They soon moved and carried a second reading, and after a strong, sharp fight, carried a motion to go into committee on the whole. The speaker left his place, of course, and a chairman was appointed. Now the contest raged hotter than ever. 
for the authority that compels order when the House sits as a House is greatly diminished when it sits as a committee. The main fight came upon the filling of the blanks with the sum to be appropriated for the purchase of the land, of course. Mr. Chairman, I move you, sir, that the words three millions of be inserted. Mr. Chairman, I move that the words two and a half dollars be inserted. Mr. Chairman, I move the insertion of the words five and twenty cents as representing the true value of this barren and isolated tract of desolation. The question, according to rule, was taken upon the smallest sum first. It was lost. Then upon the next smallest sum. Also lost. Then upon the three millions. After a vigorous battle that lasted a considerable time, this motion was carried. Then, clause by clause, the bill was read, discussed, and amended in trifling particulars, and now the committee rose and reported. The moment the House had resumed its functions and received the report, Mr. Buckstone moved and carried the third reading of the bill. The same bitter war over the sum to be paid was fought over again, and now that the eyes and nays could be called and placed on the record, every man was compelled to vote by name on the three millions, and indeed on every paragraph of the bill from the enacting clause straight through. But, as before, the friends of the measure stood firm and voted in a solid body every time, and so did its enemies. The supreme moment was come now, but so sure was the result that not even a voice was raised to interpose an adjournment. The enemy were totally demoralized. The bill was put upon its final passage almost without dissent, and the calling of the eyes and nays began. When it was ended, the triumph was complete. The two-thirds vote held good, and a veto was impossible, as far as the House was concerned. Mr. Buckstone resolved that now that the nail was driven home, he could clinch it on the other side and make it stay forever. He moved a reconsideration of the vote by which the bill had passed. The motion was lost, of course, and the Great Industrial University Act was an accomplished fact as far as it was in the power of the House of Representatives to make it so. There was no need to move an adjournment. The instant the last motion was decided, the enemies of the university rose and flocked out of the hall, talking angrily and its friends flocked after them, jubilant and congratulatory. The galleries disgorged their burden, and presently the house was silent and deserted. When Colonel Sellers and Washington stepped out of the building, they were surprised to find that the daylight was old and the sun well up. Said to Colonel, Give me a hand, my boy. You're all right at last. You're a millionaire. At least you're going to be. This thing is dead sure. Don't you bother about the Senate. Leave me and Dilworthy to take care of that. Run along home now and tell Laura. Lord, it's magnificent news, perfectly magnificent. Run now. I'll telegraph my wife. She must come here and help me build a house. Everything's all right now. Washington was so dazed by his good fortune and so bewildered by the gaudy pageant of dreams that was already trailing its long ranks through his brain, that he wandered he knew not where, and so loitered by the way that when at last he reached home he worked to a sudden annoyance in the fact that his news must be old to Laura now, for of course Senator Dilworthy must have already been home and told her an hour before. He knocked at the door, but there was no answer. That is like the Duchess, he said. Always cool, a body can't excite her, can't keep her excited anyway. Now she's gone off to sleep again, as comfortable as if she were used to picking up a million dollars every day or two. Then he went to bed. But he could not sleep, so he got up and wrote a long, rapturous letter to Louise and another to his mother. And he closed both to much the same effect. Laura will be Queen of America now, and she will be applauded and honored and petted by the whole nation. Her name will be in everyone's mouth more than ever, 
how they will court her and quote her bright speeches. And mine, too, I suppose. Though they do that more already than they really seem to deserve. Oh, the world is so bright now and so cheery. The clouds are all gone. Our long struggle is ended. Our troubles are all over. Nothing can ever make us unhappy any more. You dear faithful ones will have the reward of your patient waiting now. How Father's wisdom is proven at last! And how I repent me, that there have been times when I lost faith and said, the blessing he stored up for us a tedious generation ago was but a long-drawn curse, a blight upon us all. But everything is well now. We are done with poverty sad toil, weariness, and heartbreak. All the world is filled with sunshine. End of chapter 45 Recording by Tom Lennon Chapter 46 of The Gilded Age This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Tom Lennon The Gilded Age by Mark Twain and Charles Dudley Warner Chapter 46 Philip left the Capitol and walked up Pennsylvania Avenue in company with Senator Dilworthy. It was a bright spring morning, the air was soft and inspiring. In the deepening wayside green, the pink flush of the blossoming peach trees, the soft suffusion on the heights of Arlington, and the breath of the warm south wind was apparent the annual miracle of the resurrection of the earth. The senator took off his hat and seemed to open his soul to the sweet influences of the morning. After the heat and noise of the chamber, under its dull gas-illuminated glass canopy, and the all-night struggle of passion and feverish excitement there, the open, tranquil world seemed like heaven. The senator was not in an exultant mood, but rather in a condition of holy joy, befitting a Christian statesman whose benevolent plans providence has made its own and stamped with approval. The great battle had been fought, but the measure had still to encounter the scrutiny of the Senate, and Providence sometimes acts differently in the two houses. Still, the senator was tranquil, for he knew that there is an esprit de corps in the Senate which does not exist in the House, the effect of which is to make the members complacent towards the projects of each other, and to extend a mutual aid which in a more vulgar body would be called log-rolling. It is, under Providence, a good night's work, Mr. Sterling, the government has founded an institution which will remove half the difficulty from the southern problem, and it is a good thing for the Hawkins heirs, a very good thing. Laura will be almost a millionaire. Do you think, Mr. Dilworthy, that the Hawkinses will get much of the money, asked Philip innocently, remembering the fate of the Columbus River appropriation? The senator looked at his companion as scrutinizingly for a moment to see if he meant anything personal, and then replied, Undoubtedly, undoubtedly, I have had their interest greatly at heart. There will, of course, be a few expenses, but the widow and orphans will realize all that Mr. Hawkins dreamed of for them. The birds were singing as they crossed the presidential square now bright with its green turf and tender foliage. After the two had gained the steps of the senator's house, they stood a moment, looking upon the heavenly prospect. "'It's like the peace of God,' said the senator devoutly. Entering the house, the senator called a servant and said, "'Tell Miss Laura that we are waiting for her. I ought to have sent a messenger on horseback half an hour ago.' he added to Philip, she will be transported with our victory. You must stop to breakfast and see the excitement. The servant soon came back with a wondering look and reported, 
Miss Laura ain't dar, sir. I reckon she ain't been dar all night. The senator and Philip both started up. In Laura's room there were marks of a confused and hasty departure. Drawers half open, little articles strewn on the floor. The bed had not been disturbed. Upon inquiry it appeared that Laura had not been at dinner, excusing herself to Mrs. Dilworthy on the plea of a violent headache, that she made a request to the servants that she might not be disturbed. The senator was astounded. Philip thought at once of Colonel Selby. Could Laura have run away with him? The senator thought not. In fact, it could not be. General Leffenwell, the member from New Orleans, had casually told him at the house last night that Selby and his family went to New York yesterday morning and were to sail for Europe today. Philip had another idea which he did not mention. He seized his hat, and saying that he would go and see what he could learn, ran to the lodgings of Harry, whom he had not seen since yesterday afternoon, when he had left him to go to the house. Harry was not in. He had gone out with a handbag before six o'clock yesterday, saying that he had to go to New York, but should return next day. In Harry's room on the table, Philip found this note. Dear Mr. Brearley, can you meet me at the six o'clock train and be my escort to New York? I have to go about this university bill. The vote of an absent member we must have here, Senator Dilworthy, cannot go. Yours, L.H. Confound it, said Philip. The noodle has fallen into her trap, and she promised she would let him alone. He only stopped to send a note to Senator Dilworthy, telling him what he had found, and that he should go at once to New York, and then hastened to the railway station. He had to wait an hour for a train, and when it did start it seemed to go at a snail's pace. Philip was devoured with anxiety. Where could they have gone? What was Laura's object in taking Harry? Had the flight anything to do with Selby? Would Harry be such a fool as to be dragged into some public scandal? It seemed as if the train would never reach Baltimore. Then there was a long delay at Hava de Grace. A hot box had to be cooled at Wilmington. Would it never get on? Only in passing around the city of Philadelphia did the train not seem to go slow. Philip stood upon the platform and watched for the Bolton's house fancied he could distinguish its roof among the trees, and wondered how Ruth would feel if she knew he was so near her. Then came Jersey. Everlasting Jersey. Stupid, irritating Jersey, where the passengers are always asking which line they are on, and where they are to come out, and whether they have yet reached Elizabeth. Launched into Jersey, one has a vague notion that he is on many lines and no one in particular, and that he is liable at any moment to come to Elizabeth. He has no notion what Elizabeth is, and always resolves that the next time he goes that way, he will look out the window and see what it is like. But he never does. Or if he does, he probably finds that it is Princeton or something of that sort. He gets annoyed and never can see the use of having different names for stations in Jersey. By and by there is Newark. Three or four Newarks, apparently. Then marshes. Then long rock cuttings devoted to the advertisements of patent medicines and ready-made clothing and New York tonics for Jersey agues. And Jersey City is reached. On the ferry boat, Philip bought an evening paper from a boy crying, "'Ears the evening gram, all about the murder!' and with a breathless haste ran his eye over the following. "'Shocking murder! Tragedy in high life! A beautiful woman shoots a distinguished Confederate soldier at the Southern Hotel! Jealousy the cause!' This morning occurred another of those shocking murders 
which have become the almost daily food of the newspapers, the direct result of the socialistic doctrines and women's rights agitations, which have made every woman the avenger of her own wrongs and all society the hunting ground for her victims. About nine o'clock, a lady deliberately shot a man dead in the public parlor of the Southern Hotel, coolly remarking as she threw down her revolver and permitted herself to be taken to custody, he brought it on himself. Our reporters were immediately dispatched to the scene of the tragedy and gathered the following particulars. Yesterday afternoon, arrived at the hotel from Washington, Colonel George Selby and family, who had taken passage and were to sail at noon today in the steamer Scotia for England. The colonel was a handsome man, about forty, a gentleman of wealth and high social position, a resident of New Orleans. He served with distinction in the Confederate Army and received a wound in the leg from which he has never entirely recovered being obliged to use a cane in locomotion. This morning, at about nine o'clock, a lady, accompanied by a gentleman, called at the office of the hotel and asked for Colonel Selby. The colonel was at breakfast. Would the clerk tell him that a lady and gentleman wished to see him for a moment in the parlor? The clerk said that the gentleman asked her, What do you want to see him for? And that she replied, he is going to Europe, and I ought to just say good-bye. Colonel Selby was informed, and the lady and gentleman were shown to the parlor, in which there were at the time three or four other persons. Five minutes after, two shots were fired in quick succession, and there was a rush to the parlor from which the reports came. Colonel Selby was found lying on the floor, bleeding, but not dead. Two gentlemen, who had just come in, had seized the lady, who made no resistance, and she was at once given in charge of a police officer who arrived. The persons who were in the parlor agree substantially as to what had occurred. They had happened to be looking towards the door when the man, Colonel Selby, entered with his cane, and they looked at him, because he stopped as if surprised and frightened, and made a backward movement. At the same moment, the lady in the bonnet advanced toward him and said something like, George, will you go with me? He replied, throwing up his hand and retreating, My God, I can't, don't fire. And the next instance, two shots were heard and he fell. The lady appeared to be beside herself with rage or excitement and trembled very much when the gentleman took hold of her. It was to them, she said, he brought it on himself. Colonel Selby was carried at once to his room, and Dr. Puffer, the eminent surgeon, was sent for. It was found that he was shot through the breast and through the abdomen. Other aid was summoned, but the wounds were mortal, and Colonel Selby expired in an hour, in pain. But his mind was clear to the last, and he made a full deposition. The substance of it was that his murderer is a Miss Laura Hawkins, whom he had known at Washington as a lobbyist, and had had some business with her. She had followed him with her attentions and solicitations, and had endeavored to make him desert his wife and go to Europe with her. When he resisted and avoided her, she had threatened him. Only the day before he left Washington, she had declared that he would never go out of the city alive without her. It seems to have been a deliberate and premeditated murder, the woman following him from Washington on purpose to commit it. We learn that the murderess, who is a woman of dazzling and transcendent beauty, is about twenty-six or seven. She's a niece of Senator Dilworthy, at whose house she has been spending the winter. She belongs to a high southern family and has the reputation of being an heiress. Like some other great beauties and belles in Washington, however, there have been whispers that she had something to do with the lobby. If we mistake not, we have heard her name mentioned in connection with the sale of the Tennessee lands to the Knobs University, the bill for which passed the House last night. Her companion is a Mr. Harry Brearley a New York dandy who has been in Washington. 
His connection with her and with this tragedy is not known. But he was also taken into custody and will be detained at least as a witness. P.S. One of the persons present in the parlor says that after Laura Hawkins had fired twice, she turned the pistol towards herself, but that Brearley sprung and caught it from her hand, and that it was he who threw it to the floor. Further particulars with full biographies of all the parties in our next edition. Philip hastened at once to the Southern Hotel, where he found still a great state of excitement and a thousand different and exaggerated stories passing from mouth to mouth. The witnesses of the event had told it over so many times that they had worked it up into a most dramatic scene, and embellished it with whatever could heighten its awfulness. Outsiders had taken up invention also. The colonel's wife had gone insane, they said. The children had rushed into the parlor and rolled themselves in their father's blood. The hotel clerk said that he noticed there was murder in the woman's eye when he saw her. A person who had met the woman on the stairs felt a creeping sensation. Some thought Brearley was an accomplice and that he had set the woman on to kill his rival. Some said the woman showed the calmness and indifference of insanity. Philip learned that Harry and Laura had both been taken to the city prison, and he went there, but he was not admitted. Not being a newspaper reporter, he could not see either of them that night, but the officer questioned him suspiciously and asked him who he was. He might perhaps see Brearley in the morning. The latest editions of the evening papers had the result of the inquest. It was a plain enough case for the jury, but they sat over it a long time, listening to the wrangling of the physicians. Dr. Puffer insisted that the man died from the effects of the wound in his chest. Dr. Dobb as strongly insisted that the wound in his abdomen caused death. Dr. Golightly suggested that in his opinion death ensued from a complication of the two wounds and perhaps other causes. He examined the table waiter as to whether Colonel Selby ate any breakfast and what he ate and if he had any appetite. The jury finally threw themselves back upon the indisputable fact that Selby was dead, that either wound would have killed him, admitted by the doctors, and rendered a verdict that he died from pistol shot wounds inflicted by a pistol in the hands of Laura Hawkins. The morning papers blazed with big type and overflowed with details of the murder. The accounts in the evening papers were only the premonitory drops to this mighty shower. The scene was dramatically worked up in column after column. There were sketches, biographical and historical. There were long specials from Washington, giving a full history of Laura's career there and the names of men with whom she was said to be intimate, a description of Senator Dilworthy's residence and of his family, and of Laura's room in his house, and a sketch of the senator's appearance and what he had said. There was a great deal about her beauty, her accomplishments, and her brilliant position in society, and her doubtful position in society. There was also an interview with Colonel Sellers and another with Washington Hawkins, the brother of the murderess. One journal had a long dispatch from Hawkeye, reporting the excitement in that quiet village and the reception of the awful intelligence. All the parties had been interviewed. There were reports of conversations with the clerk at the hotel, with the call boy, with the waiter at the table, with all the witnesses, with the policeman, with the landlord who wanted it understood that nothing of that sort had ever happened in his house before, although it had always been frequented by the best Southern society, and with Mrs. Colonel Selby. There were diagrams illustrating the scene of the shooting, and views of the hotel and street, and portraits of the parties. 
There were three minute and different statements from the doctors about the wounds, so technically worded that nobody could understand them. Harry and Laura had also been interviewed, and there was a statement from Philip himself, which a reporter had knocked him up out of bed at midnight to give, though how he found him Philip never could conjecture. What some of the journalists lacked in suitable length for the occasion, they made up in encyclopedic information about other similar murders and shootings. The statement from Laura was not full. In fact, it was fragmentary and consisted of nine parts of the reporter's valuable observations to one of Laura's. And it was, as the reporter significantly remarked, incoherent. But it appeared that Laura claimed to be Selby's wife or to have been his wife, that he had deserted her and betrayed her, and that she was going to follow him to Europe. When the reporter asked, What made you shoot him, Miss Hawkins? Laura's only reply was very simply, Did I shoot him? Do they say I shot him? And she would say no more. The news of the murder was made the excitement of the day. Talk of it filled the town. The facts reported were scrutinized. The standing of the parties was discussed. The dozen different theories of the motive broached in the newspapers were disputed over. During the night, subtle electricity had carried the tale over all the wires of the continent and under the sea. And in all the villages and towns of the Union, from the Atlantic to the territories, and away up and down the Pacific Slope, and as far as London and Paris and Berlin, that morning the name of Laura Hawkins was spoken by millions and millions of people, while the owner of it, the sweet child of years ago, the beautiful queen of Washington drawing rooms, sat shivering on her cot bed in the darkness of a damp cell in the tombs. End of chapter 46 Recording by Tom Lennon Chapter 47 of The Gilded Age. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Richard Kilmer. The Gilded Age by Mark Twain and Charles Dudley Warner. Chapter 47. Philip's first effort was to get Harry out of the tombs. He gained permission to see him in the presence of an officer during the day, and he found that hero very much cast down. "'I never intended to come to such a place as this, old fellow,' he said to Philip. "'It's no place for a gentleman. They've no idea how to treat a gentleman. Look at that provender, pointing to his uneaten prison ration. They tell me I am detained as a witness, and I passed the night among a lot of cutthroats and dirty rascals.' A pretty witness I'd be in a month spent in such company. "'But what under heavens,' asked Philip, "'induced you to come to New York with Laura? "'What was it for?' "'What for? "'Why, she wanted me to come. "'I didn't know anything about that cursed Selby. "'She said it was lobby business for the university. "'I'd no idea what she was dragging me into, "'that confounded hotel for. "'I suppose she knew that the Southerners all go there, and thought she'd find her man. Oh, Lord, I wish I'd taken your advice. You might as well murder somebody and have the credit for it as get into the newspapers the way I have. She's pure devil, that girl. You ought to have seen how sweet she was on me. What an ass I am. Well, I'm not going to dispute a poor prisoner. But the first thing is to get you out of this. I brought the note Laura wrote you, for one thing and I've seen your uncle, and explained the truth of the case to him. He will be here soon. Harry's uncle came with other friends, and in the course of the day made such a showing to the authorities that Harry was released on giving bonds to appear as a witness when wanted. His spirits rose with their usual elasticity as soon as he was out of Center Street, and he insisted on giving Philip and his friends a royal supper at Delmonico's, an excess which was perhaps excusable in the rebound of his feelings, 
and which was committed with his usual reckless generosity. Harry ordered the supper, and it is perhaps needless to say that Philip paid the bill. Neither of the young men felt like attempting to see Laura that day, and she saw no company except the newspaper reporters until the arrival of Colonel Sellers and Washington Hawkins, who had hastened to New York with all speed. They found Laura in a cell in the upper tier of the woman's department. The cell was somewhat larger than those in the men's department, and might be eight feet by ten feet square, perhaps a little longer. It was of stone, floor, and all, and tile roof was oven-shaped. A narrow slit in the roof admitted sufficient light, and was the only means of ventilation. When the window was opened, there was nothing to prevent the rain coming in. The only means of heating being from the corridor, when the door was ajar. The cell was chilly, and at this time damp. It was whitewashed and clean, but it had a slight jail odor. Its only furniture was a narrow iron bedstead, with a tick of straw and some blankets, not too clean. When Colonel Sellers was conducted to this cell by the matron and looked in, his emotions quite overcame him. The tears rolled down his cheeks, and his voice trembled so that he could hardly speak. Washington was unable to say anything. He looked from Laura to the miserable creatures who were walking in the corridor with unutterable disgust. Laura was alone calm and self-contained, though she was not unmoved by the sight of the grief of her friends. "'Are you comfortable, Laura?' was the first word the Colonel could get out. "'You see,' she replied, "'I can't say it's exactly comfortable.' "'Are you cold?' "'It is pretty chilly. The stone floor is like ice. It chills me through to step on it. I have to sit on the bed.' "'Poor thing, poor thing. And can you eat anything?' "'No, I'm not hungry. I don't know that I could eat anything. I can't eat that.' "'Oh, dear,' continued the Colonel. It's dreadful. But cheer up, dear, cheer up. And the colonel broke down entirely. But, he went on, we'll stand by you. We'll do everything for you. I know you couldn't have meant to do it. It must have been insanity, you know, or something of that sort. You never did anything of the sort before. Laura smiled very faintly and said, Yes, it was something of that sort. It's all a whirl. He was a villain. You don't know. I'd rather have killed him myself in a duel, you know, all fair. I wish I had. But don't you be down. We'll get you the best counsel. The lawyers in New York can do anything. I've read of cases. But you must be comfortable now. We've brought some of your clothes at the hotel. What else can we get for you? Laura suggested that she would like some sheets for her bed, a piece of carpet to step on, and her meals sent in and some books and writing materials, if it was allowed. The Colonel and Washington promised to procure all these things, and then took their sorrowful leave, a great deal more affected than the criminal was, apparently, by her situation. The Colonel told the matron as he went away that if she would look to Laura's comfort a little, it shouldn't be the worse for her, and to the turnkey who let them out, he patronizingly said, You've got a big establishment here, a credit to the city. I've got a friend in there. I shall see you again, sir. By the next day, something more of Laura's own story began to appear in the newspapers, colored and heightened by reporters' rhetoric. Some of them cast a lurid light upon the colonel's career and represented his victim as a beautiful avenger of her murdered innocence, and others pictured her as his willing paramour and pitiless slayer. Her communications to the reporters were stopped by her lawyers as soon as they were retained, and visited her. But this fact did not prevent, it may have facilitated, the appearance of casual paragraphs here and there which were likely to beget popular sympathy for the poor girl. The occasion did not pass without improvement by the leading journals and Philip preserved the editorial comments of three or four of them which pleased him most. These he used to read aloud to his friends afterwards, and ask them to guess from which journal each of them had been cut. One began in this simple manner. History never repeats itself, but the kaleidoscope combinations 
of the pictured present often seem to be constructed out of the broken fragments of antique legends. Washington is not Corinth, and Laius, the beautiful daughter of Tamandra, might not have been the prototype of the ravishing Laura, daughter of the plebeian House of Hawkins. But the orators and statesmen, who were the purchasers of the favors of the one, may have been as incorruptible as the Republican statesmen who learned how to love and how to vote from the sweet lips of the Washington lobbyist. And perhaps the modern Laius would never have departed from the national capital if there had been there even one Republican xenocrats who resisted her blandishments. But here the parallel fails. Laius, wandering away with the youth Repostratus, is slain by the woman who are jealous of her charms. Laura, straying into Thessaly with the young Byerly, slays her other lover and becomes the champion of the wrongs of her sex. Another journal began its editorial with less lyrical beauty, but with equal force. It closed as follows. With Laura Hawkins, fair, fascinating, and fatal, and with the dissolute colonel of a lost cause who has reaped the harvest he sowed, we have nothing to do. But as the curtain rises on this awful tragedy, we catch a glimpse of the society at the Capitol under this administration, which we cannot contemplate without alarm for the fate of the Republic. A third newspaper took up the subject in a different tone. It said, Our repeated predictions are verified. The pernicious doctrines, which we have announced as prevailing in American society, have been again illustrated. The name of the city is becoming a reproach. We may have done something in averting its ruin in our resolute exposure of the great frauds. We shall not be deterred from insisting that the outraged laws for the protection of human life shall be vindicated now, so that a person can walk the streets or enter the public houses at least in the daytime without risk of a bullet through his brain. The fourth journal began its remarks as follows. The fullness with which we present our readers this morning the details of the Selby Hawkins homicide is a miracle of modern journalism. Subsequent investigations can do little to fill out the picture. It is the old story. A beautiful woman shoots her absconding lover in cold blood, and we shall doubtless learn in due time that if she was not as mad as a hare in this month of March, she was at least laboring under what is termed momentary insanity. It would not be too much to say that upon the first publication of the facts of the tragedy, there was an almost universal feeling of rage against the murderess in the tombs, and that reports of her beauty only heightened the indignation. It was as if she presumed upon that and upon her sex to defy the law, and there was a fervent hope that the law would take its plain course. Yet Laura was not without friends, and some of them very influential, too. She had in keeping a great many secrets, and a great many reputations, perhaps. Who shall set himself up to judge human motives? Why, indeed, might we not feel pity for a woman whose brilliant career had been so suddenly extinguished in misfortune and crime? Those who had known her so well in Washington might find it impossible to believe that the fascinating woman could have had murder in her heart, and would readily give ear to the current sentimentality about the temporary aberration of mine under the stress of personal calamity. Senator Dilworthy was greatly shocked, of course, but he was full of charity for the airing. We shall all need mercy, he said. Laura, as an inmate of my family, was a most exemplary female, amiable, affectionate, and truthful, perhaps too fond of gaiety, and neglectful of the externals of religion, but a woman of principle. She may have had experiences of which I am ignorant, but she could not have gone to this extremity if she had been in her own right mind. To the Senator's credit, be it said, he was willing to help Laura and her family in this dreadful trial. She herself was not without money, for the Washington lobbyist is not seldom more fortunate than the Washington claimant, and she was able to procure a good many luxuries to mitigate the severity of her prison life. It enabled her also to have her own family near her, and to see some of them daily. 
the tender solicitude of her mother, her childlike grief, and her firm belief in the real guiltlessness of her daughter, touched even the custodians of the tombs who are inured to scenes of pathos. Mrs. Hawkins had hastened to her daughter as soon as she received money for the journey. She had no reproaches. She had only tenderness and pity. She could not shut out the dreadful facts of the case, but it had been enough for her that Laura had said in their first interview, Mother, I did not know what I was doing. She obtained lodgings near the prison and devoted her life to her daughter, as if she had been really her own child. She would have remained in the prison day and night if it had been permitted. She was aged and feeble, but this great necessity seemed to give her new life. The pathetic story of the old lady's ministrations and her simplicity and faith also got into the newspapers in time, and probably added to the pathos of this wrecked woman's fate, which was beginning to be felt by the public. It was certain that she had champions who thought that her wrongs ought to be placed against her crime, and expression of this feeling came to her in various ways. Visitors came to see her, and gifts of fruit and flowers were sent, which brought some cheer into her hard and gloomy cell. Laura had declined to see either Philip or Harry, somewhat to the former's relief, who had a notion that she would necessarily feel humiliated by seeing him after breaking faith with him. But to the discomfiture of Harry, who still felt her fascination and thought her refusal heartless. He told Philip that of course he had got through with such a woman, but he wanted to see her. Philip, to keep him from some new foolishness, persuaded him to go with him to Philadelphia and give his valuable service in the mining operations at Ilium. The law took its course with Laura. She was indicted for murder in the first degree and held for trial at the summer term. The two most distinguished criminal lawyers in the city had been retained for her defense, and to that the resolute woman devoted her days with a courage that rose as she consulted with her counsel and understood the methods of criminal procedure in New York. She was greatly depressed, however, by the news from Washington. Congress adjourned, and her bill had failed to pass the Senate. It must wait for the next session. End of chapter 47 Recording by Richard Kilmer, Rio Medina, Texas